Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this fun Fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And we've already started having fun even before we went live. It, Crips, Brother Crips, how much fun have you had so far? Um, I, I've had so much fun that oh. I, I almost want to excuse myself because I'm afraid what will happen. <laughs> We have to be careful because there could be some kind of like a spontaneous combustion. We could explode from from uh, too much fun. We could because, you know, I've always wondered how that happens. And it could be that someone's having too much fun. <laughs> All right. Thank you, brother. Uh, brother Ben, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. The most fun I've ever had when I was a kid, I actually peed my pants. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> but... I am very, uh, very excited to be on tonight's program, tonight's program, One Fellowship Friday. All right. And our sister, Sister Paula. Hey, everybody. Good to be here. Um, was Ben trying to do a, an impression? I don't know what it was. It sounded like it. Mm. Hmm. But <laughs> good to see it's good to see everybody. Good to see everybody in the chat. And I also peed my pants once when my brother was telling me jokes. And I was like, stop, I'm gonna pee my pants. And he closed the door and wouldn't let me out and kept telling me jokes until I actually peed my pants. Nice. That's a brother for you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. That's uh what's that saying? Uh, too much information? No, not really. I don't mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sister Lisa, how are you doing? Want to say hi to the congregation? Yeah, praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. How's everyone doing this evening? I'm glad to be here on Fun Fellowship Friday. Awesome. Thank you, Sister. All right. And I see it looks like we've got uh, so far 22 people uh, tuning in. And... Uh, Plenty of saints in the chat room. Uh, let me just remind everybody in the chat room, uh, on Friday nights, uh, more so than any other program, we, we want to make sure you're involved. So uh, um, participate in the uh, answering the questions so that we can register your answer on the poll. Uh, and also participate by uh, anything that's uh, relevant to the subject, put it in all caps so we, uh, we can notice it. And that way we'll be able to respond to your questions your thoughts and questions. All right. Um, okay. Let me see. We don't have Sister Angel here with us. I haven't heard anything from her. Does anybody know what's going on? I do not. Yeah. All right. Well, perhaps she'll, she'll join us. Uh, yeah, she probably will be joining us. I mean, I, I, she offered a question earlier, so I'm assuming she's coming. Yes. Okay. Very good. And uh, while speaking of questions, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, responding to our pleas. Uh, I mean, that's P-L-E-A-S, pleading uh, for questions or, or true false statements. Uh, many people have uh, submitted them, and so we're in good shape now, but that doesn't mean we don't want more. Still, I, I'd like to everybody to, to, to participate. Um, that, that, not only is it participating by just being here, but hey, participate by by uh, putting some of these uh, true false statements uh, to the test for us. Uh, so you'll have to be a little bit creative. Sometimes you got to do a little bit of thinking to try to uh, come up with something new. But uh, make an effort so that we get questions from everybody. There you go. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, unless there's something uh, we need to talk about first, let's uh, let's go into the uh, first question. Okay, the first question is, or statement is, true or false, the hypostatic union is current, currently in place. The hypostatic union is currently in place. That's got to be a joke. All right, and I'm the one that submitted that one, so I'll go last, but let me answer twin talk first. How do I send you my questions? Um, uh, the church email is church of the eternally secure at gmail.com. Just send your uh, and that, that applies for our Sunday church program too. If you have any questions to submit uh, for Sundays 
or if you have any true false statements to submit for the Friday program, uh, that's where you send them. All right, thank you, Twin Talk. Uh, all right, uh, who would like to go first on that? And uh, wait, maybe maybe um, this might be a little bit uh, necessary to um, explain. Does anybody need me to give any explanation on this, or is that is it clear what I'm asking? No, I, I, I have don't. no idea what it is. Yeah, I don't know what it is either. I've never heard that term ever. Oh, okay. I right. thought it was a joke, honestly. I thought you, you were making a joke to make everyone feel <laughs> stupid. All right, let me define the terms, and then that way you might take a minute to think about how you want to answer it. But the hypostatic union is uh, a term that just means that uh, in, in the incarnation, uh, during the, the life of Jesus, um, the 33 years, that um, he existed as um, uh, a fully man and also at the same time fully God. Now, I think we everybody understands that concept and sure, we all sure. agree that that is a fact. The question is, is the hypostatic union in effect right now? Is Jesus existing at this present time as fully man and fully God? Okay. Now, is, it, is that clear or does it need any more explanation? Great question. No, that's, that's clear. Okay. All right, then. Uh, let me see who would like to go first. Um, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would have to say, uh, leaning true. Um, he is, well, I mean, he is still God that never changed. He was God before he's still God. He became a man. And from my understanding, he still is keeping that form, <laughs> the form of a man. He has his glorified body. So I guess the real question is when we get changed, are we still considered, I mean, we're not God, but are we still considered men and women? I would say, yes. Yeah. So by those standards, I would say that, yes, he's fully man and fully God. He's not flesh, but that's not the way the question's phrased. Uh, doesn't have the same flesh anymore, but he's still, he's still fully God and fully man. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Uh, before we move to the, the next person answering, uh, let me respond to Renee Washington. Since you, you did what I asked, um, uh, we want the chat room to participate and make your point in all caps. That way I know you're trying to participate. And Renee says, this is more of a statement than a question. And uh, Renee, maybe um, you, you, are new or regarding this program on Friday nights. I recognize your name, uh, but uh, that's what we do on Friday nights. We make a statement and say, is it true or false? Uh, so you are right. It is a statement and we're asking to, uh, everybody, is this statement true or is it false? Now she says, lately I find I am backing up on people who are false prophets feeling we are too harsh. Uh, you have to tell me more about what you're referring to there, Renee, if you want us to respond to that, unless someone knows what Renee's referring to. Uh, all right, who wants to go next? Um, I'll, I guess I'll take a crack at it. Yeah. Um, all right, so it's not, it's not a question if he's still flesh. It's mm -hmm. a question if he's still man. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, like like Jason said, I mean, we are man and woman. So when we pass away, well, uh, we won't be in the flesh anymore, but we'll still be men and women, right? We'll just have glorified bodies. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, since since you defined it, Luke, as man is he still fully god he's of course still fully god is he still fully man i would think yes because he came back with his glorified body and he still had the flesh wounds in there yeah um so i imagine he still looks like that a and i imagine he still looks like his earthly form as a man um of course, I don't know, but uh, I would say leaning true, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, thanks. Well, I think uh, since this, uh, this question, the, the, even the term is uh, new for some of you, uh, that your answers are quite good considering you, you're not familiar with this subject, really. Um, how about uh, Sister Lisa? What do you have to say? Sorry, brother. Uh, so there's a mute button here. Um, yeah, I, he's fully man and fully God at the same time. If if he was not, then the devil could accuse him of being a counterfeit, and it would be an invalid sacrifice. So he has to be fully man and fully God. And the scriptures proclaim the same. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, um, uh, everybody agrees that uh, during his uh, 33 years, that this is one of the basic traditional doctrines of the church, that he is fully man and fully God. Uh, the question we're ask, asking now is, presently, is that still the case or is, has, that, has that changed? Yeah, that's my answer. Yes, he's fully okay. man and fully God. That okay. hasn't changed. All right. Okay. I, well, I was just, I thought you were referring to. Uh, oh, the, no. To no, the, no. I, I wanted no. you to refer to, you know, present case. No. Uh, uh, on, on the earth as in his manifestation in the flesh, as well as now, because the Bible still refers to him as the man Christ Jesus so in numerous places after the resurrection. Uh, so um, th that's why. And then also after the resurrection, he said, touch me and handle me for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. So he is still fully man. If uh, if he wasn't, like I said, if something else had transpired, the devil would have wherewith to accuse him. So, uh, you know, that's why the Bible says it also lets us know when he was tempted in all points, like as we are yet without sin. And then it again says in Hebrews that we have not a a savior who is not in touch with the feeling of our infirmity. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 he is still uh, fully man and, and fully God. All right. Thank you. All right, Brother Ben. Um, well, I would say that, uh, well, there's, there's a couple of verses. In general, the New Testament refers to um, believers as saints, and it usually calls unbelievers men. Uh, not, not always 100%, but uh, there's a couple of exceptions. But for the most part, believers always refer to as saints. Um, that's just one little data point. Uh, also, too, though, that um, Genesis uh, is, teaches very early on that uh, uh, things only beget after their own kind. Um, so that's another data point. Um, and uh, I mentioned before that oh, I, I think I don't remember if I just mentioned it or not. But, uh, yeah, Paul was uh, uh, reprimanding. I think it's the Corinthians. I could be wrong. But he, there was a verse that says, are you not acting like mere men? Um, and and so uh that's interesting as well and so uh and so i i i uh the bible refers to the old man and the new man and the new man is is given birth uh by uh through faith in christ and and just as the old man was given birth by uh adam who was a sinner um the new man is given birth uh through the new the the righteous man, Christ. So uh, I believe we, we are technically men, but we're a new creation. We're a new version of man, such like man 2.0 almost. Um, so again, the old man is the first birth and the new man is the new birth. And again, it, because we're considered new men, that means that Christ is, is still considered a new man or always considered a new man. Uh, so yes, I do believe he is a man uh, and fully God. Um, so it, it is a... Uh, difficult t topic to you know really wrap your mind around but uh, i do believe the hypostatic union is in place and uh has always been mm -hmm. all right thank you brother um well i am not that i am uh, feel like i'm an authority any more than anybody else here just gonna ask the question i i have to think and wonder about it myself but um Obviously, this was a of great importance in the early church, uh, this uh, establishing this as a truth. And now, uh, in this present time and, and on off into eternity, uh, it makes, I at least wonder, okay, does he still exist as man and God? Uh, 
I would say that there are, it indicates that uh, during his resurrected period before the ascension, that uh, that risen glorified body was a physical body. Um, and he, he was able to eat and drink. Uh, it seemed like it, but, but he also was able to um, materialize in a room. And he was also, I think he was able to, um, what's the word in sci-fi, um, uh, the shape shifter, or a person can change how their, their appearance is. Um, you know, when, when it says that, um, I think Mary looked up uh, and, and saw this gardener, and, and, uh, but it was Jesus, and she didn't recognize him as Gina and Jesus. Some people say, well, she was looking and the sun was behind Jesus' head and the glare made it so she couldn't recognize him. Uh, but I, I think that when she looked at Jesus and also on the road to Emmaus during that walk, uh, what Jesus has done is he had uh, been a, a shapeshifter uh, in sci-fi sci terms where he was able to change his appearance to whatever he wanted to look like. So he made himself look like someone else. So uh, at least these two abilities, his uh, glorified body had um, teleportation or, or uh, he was, you know, like in, in Star Trek, beam me up where you, your molecule just dissipate and materialize in the, in the other room or whether you change your appearance. So these are some uh, really amazing uh, abilities. Uh, and the Bible says that in one way or another, I, I can't tell you the verse, but uh, um, the, the, his body, his glorified body is a prototype for our resurrected yeah. bodies. Yeah. So our bodies will be like his. So I assume that we will be able to do these same kinds of things. And I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Also, there is a, a uh, there, there is a verse that says that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. And... Um, so uh, people like Dr. Ruckman and others I've heard, uh, they teach that um, uh, with the glorified body, that uh, we and in, in, in Jesus's resurrected body, there was no blood. Uh, there, there was flesh and bone. He, and he says, touch me, I'm flesh and bone. He didn't say I'm flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. So because of these things, there are people who say that uh, Jesus's body and our glorified bodies will be without blood. And uh, so if that's the case, uh, then you have to say, well, is, is that, are we still human uh, in that sense? Because we're not human in the way that we were. We're some kind of different, like Ben says, 2.0 or uh, a, a new version of, of human. Uh, but I do think that uh, he does ex exist bodily presently. Uh, obviously, he has, uh, uh, he has to in order to uh, stand and sit on the, th uh, the throne. Um, and um, so I, I would say the answer, I said certainly true, um, because uh, everything indicates to me that is the case, and I don't see anything in the Bible that would tell me otherwise. Mm. Okay, so does anybody want to respond anymore now that we've discussed it? Uh, did everyone respond? Did everyone, everyone answer? I think they did. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I liked your commentary, and, and uh, I think everyone had a similar answer. Uh, but I think it's exciting to think about the few things that are given to us in Scripture about what Jesus was able to do in his uh, glorified body. Uh, and we have no reason, based on Scripture, we have no reason to believe uh, if he's the first fruits of our inheritance, so to speak, as it pertains to our glorified body, then um, it stands to reason that that we would be able to do the same things uh, he does. And I also don't think that that scripture records everything that he was capable of aside from just being God. I mean, obviously God's capable of uh, way more things than we are, but we're going to, we're going to be like him. So that's interesting. And that gets my mind uh, going. Uh, so you, you touched on a couple of things. Um, uh, teleportation was the one that I thought of. That's what I thought you were referring to, but shape shifting is one of them. But, uh, being uh, transmutation, actually, I think is the word maybe better uh, fits. Uh, ben can tell me if I'm right or wrong about that, I'm sure. Uh, but the ability to, to travel uh, with a thought um, and to also pass through walls, also to still be able to eat. So I wonder just selfishly because I, uh, 
I'm doing pretty well now, uh, but I've struggled with my weight on and off all my adult life. And to be able to eat, not that I want to be a glutton, but just to not have to worry about if I'm eating something that uh, I have to worry about the weight. Uh, it's going to be a, for me at least, uh, probably for a lot of people, that's going to be a, a, a welcome change. Um, and uh, one last thing, you know, I've, I've, I've talked before about being deaf in one ear since birth. And that's one of the things I'm looking forward to is being able to hear like most people. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that are deaf in both ears, so I'm not... I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I'm not better off than a lot of people, but I, you know, like put headphones on. I've got headphones on right now, but I, I'm hearing mono instead of stereo. I um, always uh, wish that I could hear, put headphones on and hear music, for instance, uh, the way it was intended to, to be heard. So I'll be able to, I'll, I'll have that ability, I think. But anyway, um, good comments, brother. Luke. appreciate that. Thank you. I, I'd like to say something for Chris Annie. Uh, because uh, she says she came late. She would like us to explain what hypostatic union is. So I'll, I'll explain it again. It only takes a second. And hypostatic union is the term that the church uh, adopted to state that when, during Jesus' life, uh, he existed as fully God and fully man at the same time. And my, the question is, is that the case today? and off into the future is is Jesus still fully man and fully God. So that's what we've been discussing. Um, I will say that um, as far as the eating, uh, um, I think we're going to be eating. I mean, after all, there are verses in Revelation talking about the the, the, the trees with the fruit and the, the drinking from the, uh, the, the river of life. And mm -hmm. so we'll be eating and drinking. Um, I don't think we're going to be meat eaters at that time, though, because it says there's going to be there's to be no more death. Um, um, doesn't bother me anymore because I switched over to almost full vegan lately. So I'm quite happy just eating uh, plant life. I just still eat a little bit of uh, meat, but uh, uh, I, I do think that uh, we'll probably be just eating um, uh, plant life. Uh, I don't think we'll need it though uh, for any reason, unless those trees have something in it that we need uh, and that might be the case it might be just like with the the the, the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil and then the, the tree of life and and uh, uh, maybe someone can tell me more off the top of their head about the various trees uh, in the uh, uh, in heaven that uh, we eat off of uh, it says there's something different every month if I remember it right I bet you Paul I bet you Paula knows about that. Uh, I, I It's vague, but I think it's like 12 different types of fruit throughout the year or something. I can look it up if you want. One of them tastes like steak, I guarantee you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's say hi to Sister Angel now that I see that she's with us. Sister Angel. Hey, guys. Hello? Yeah. Hey, how are you guys? I had to uh, wait till my earbuds were charged. Uh, so that I could get on because they weren't charging properly the whole time I thought they were. So, <laughs> um, are, you, are you able to respond to the question? Um, uh, whether or not I think hypostatic union will be um, something that is like is currently like the state of Christ and also for eternity. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I I would think that he is now, but I wouldn't think. I don't necessarily think that means he. Uh, Perhaps, you know what? Probably, probably leading true, leading true. I treat, I believe that he probably will be the same, uh, same on into eternity. I think maybe that could be the, the, the purpose, um, uh, kind of reconciling a uh, man and God in his own person that way. So, um, mm -hmm. but I, I haven't ever really thought about this, so I didn't get to hear a lot of the responses. So mm -hmm. I have to go back and listen because it's very interesting. All right. Thank you. Um, I, Lisa posted something uh, that uh, there's a verse, uh, uh, Colossians 2, 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, uh, that's got to be talking about uh, uh, present time because uh, Colossians was written, I, I think, in the 50s, uh, around 50-something A.D., so that that would mean that Jesus had already ascended, and then that means that if he, if he has existing bodily but still has all the fullness of god 
Um, so I think that verse here would probably uh, be the best proof text. Um, mm. All right, anybody want to say more? No, that's very interesting, though. All right. Okay. Um, well, that verse you were talking about of the uh, fruit is in Revelation 22 and verse 2. It says, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were, of, were for the healing of the nations. Hmm. Okay. So uh, I guess, um, is it okay for me to take from that, that uh, we will be eating from that tree, a different fruit every month? Uh, so we'll be eating fruit. I don't, does anybody think that... Uh, We'll be eating any uh, meat. Yes. You think? No. I do. <laughs> I don't think we'll be eating. I think well, we'll be if there, do you think that uh, uh, when the Bible says there will be no more death, it's only applying to human? Or it don't, I think that it's more broad. It's no more death, uh, period. No, I, I I don't disagree with that. But are, are we limiting God as, as to say that he can't somehow create meat without death? That's true. I didn't know he could do that. Well, he did say the word meat used it for food before flesh, before they killed the flesh and, and ate it. He said, like, all the herbs will be for your meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, meat, meat uh, uh, sometimes, you can talk about uh, how the uh, fruit has meat. It, you know, the, the, the material of fruit was sometimes referred to as meat. It, it could also maybe mean sustenance, like, I, I feel like I've heard, like, that's your sustenance, you know, people call meat today, like, your primary sustenance are really one of the most important things you can eat, so, because um, herbs, uh, whenever I hear herbs, maybe herbs has a different meaning um, in scripture, because when I think of herbs, I think of leafy, you know, green material type thing so i don't think of like fleshy fruit but maybe that's not how it's meant i, I don't know does anybody know mm -hmm. well one thing that's interesting is that uh i know there are um i believe everything in creation i mean i don't think this is controversial or, or uh, profound anyway but well maybe profound but not not, not any revelatory um that uh, all of creation um is a uh, is a fallen form of of its uh eternal uh, or how it was originally designed to be and what's right. interesting there is um uh certain um plants that will uh they have like uh they have like fruit essentially i'm not sure if you consider it fruit or maybe I, I, it's probably a technically fruit but it smells like rotting uh meat the uh, flowers the yes, flowers yes, too. yeah yes. i had one of those plants in my house of key west it's awful mm -hmm. <laughs> you now autumn says uh no I think that's supposed to be, you know, she said ND, but I think that's a typo. She said, no, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Well, okay. Um, uh, it doesn't say that anywhere that we're eating the fruit, but I would assume we'd be eating the fruit, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. But what about the leaves? How are the leaves going to heal the nations? Do, do we have to eat the leaves then? Uh, I, you know, this is, it's hard to really... Uh, uh, have a conclusion because this is not it doesn't telling us enough right well, I, I think autumn was just she just put up revelation 22 2 and then that was the second part of it so so it was and the leaves of oh the and it's not no it's yeah. and, but there's an a missing right uh, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the day okay thank you so uh but um what does that mean then? If it's it, it says the, and the leaves were for of the tree for were for the healing of the nations. What do you think? Do you think people are going to eat the leaves? Or <laughs> I don't. I really don't know what to think. Well, it's, it's perplexing. Well, why do we need healing? Um, I mean, are, 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 did Christ fully heal, heal us? I almost think yeah. it's like, like maybe perhaps like um, like caffeine almost, uh, like where it gives you a uplifter somehow. I don't know that yeah. that the healing. Well, you, you and do. why the nations? That's what I was right, thinking. right. The nations. Yeah, and yeah. it's in the eternal state. If it was in the uh, millennium, it would make a lot more sense to me. But it's in the eternal state, I believe, yeah. where it says that. Yeah, and also remember that um, 
uh, Cryptsons who have this uh, desire to keep eating meat and hope yep. God will, will create meat without death. Uh, remember, uh, be, before the flood, there was no uh, meat eating. You say. Uh, oh, well, the, the Bible says that, that when um, um, uh, the flood came, God said to Noah, now you can start eating meat. Before, before that, they weren't supposed to be eating any meat. They probably did, but we're supposed to, right? Uh, however, they sacrificed, but I'm assuming they didn't eat those sacrifices. They just sacrificed them. The blood was shed, but they didn't eat it uh, because uh, until uh, maybe someone could find the verse where uh, after the flood, and that's when God changed the rules and said, you're no longer a veg plant eater, you're a meat eater or, or hip herbivore or omnivore. All right. Did we exhaust this subject or anything else? Well, I have the comments. I can be real quick. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Anyone else have anything to say? No. Okay. Yeah, I, but, uh, give us the final tally too. Okay, one second. Um, first, first, read the comments. Um, someone says, "Oh yeah, it's definitely in place." Next person says, "Not a fan of unions. I'm assuming labor unions, but this unity I totally support." Yeah. Someone else says, "Yes, it is. Come quickly, Lord Jesus." And Laura Stubb says, "I don't know without doing research on it." And that's a good answer. Uh. Okay, yes, let me look at the uh, final tally. Okay, so uh, eight said, um, eight said true, certainly true. One said leading false. Um, one said, four said undecided. Uh, I'm sorry, let me do that over again. Eight said certainly true. One said leading true. Four undecided. One leading false. And zero said certainly false. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, if there's nothing else, Shall we go to the next question or statement? Sure. Okay, this one's mine. Um, and uh, it's, supposed, it's intended to provoke thought. Um, kind of a trick question, uh, but I'll go last. And the uh, question is, Christ died twice. Christ died twice. Huh. You wrote this one, Dad? Yes. Hmm. hmm. All right. Uh, anybody have an answer? Do you want us to start? Uh, um. I, I'm I'm trying to rack my I'm I'm trying to think about it. I don't have any problem trying to answer, but without thinking more about what the trick is. Um, there are people that believe that he died physically, and then when he went to hell, he also died spiritually, and I, I don't believe that. Um, there would be no re reason for uh, the part of him that's God for that part to die. So uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that he just died the once. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, go with that. Well, I'll go ahead and answer because I, I I don't know of anything in the Bible off the top of my head that would indicate that he did he died more than once. Right. Uh, so maybe I'm uh, missing something. I'm interested to hear what Ben has to say. Yeah, me too. So I, I'm saying uh, unless I you can show me some scripture, I'm saying uh, certainly false. Yeah. All right. Uh, that'll be that'll go for me too. I'm very curious what Ben's gonna say. But certainly, right. like I would say, leaning false for me. All right. All right. Sister Paula. Um, well, he did say it was tricky. So I'm wondering what he has to say, too. But um, upon first hearing it, the, what came to my mind is it's appointed unto men to die once. And after this, the judgment. And that's all men. And then after the judgment, if you're unsaved, you'll go to your second death. So Jesus obviously isn't going to experience that second death because that's being thrown into the lake of fire. Um, <clears throat> I think it's like your flesh dies once and then at the judgment, I think that your soul either goes to heaven or it goes through the second death. I think that's what's dying at the second death. I don't think the spirit ever 
dies. I think it goes back to God. I think it's more like uh, the energy in the body <clears throat> for saved people and for lost people. God gets his spirit back because that's the life force in their body. Mm-hmm. So I would think just because of that scripture that says it's appointed for men to die once. And of course we know that he died. I don't see how he could have died a second time because the second death I think is the death of the soul, which is for the unbelievers. So false, I would say. All right. And sister Lisa. Yes. Um, I hope I answered that correctly. Let's see. Uh, yeah, true or false, Christ died twice. I put false. Uh, the Bible said that his soul would never see corruption. Um, so uh, the whole he died spiritually thing is is, is uh, wrong. It's error, in my opinion, based on the scripture. Um, but the, um, the, the flesh... He has tasted death, I believe it says that in Hebrews, for every man. So uh, he, he did that, went into the to the uh, grave, the tomb. Is that Matthias with the ice cream? Get him, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Get him. That was, that was me. I, just, I, just, <laughs> you know, I rejected the call. I'll turn my phone off. No, it sounded like an ice cream truck, and I just immediately thought of Matthias. Um, <laughs> now, I think... <laughs> I think that uh, based upon the scripture, I don't, I can't remember or recall any scripture that said Jesus died spiritually. Uh, first of all, you also be talking about the power of God. I don't think that uh, I don't think that that there's a scripture that says that he died spiritually anywhere that I can recall. Um, the flesh, yes, and he went into the grave, but he also, this whole concept that he went to hell is, is another um, misnomer. We do not see that in the scripture either. Uh, I believe that he went down, according to the scripture, and preached the acceptable year of the Lord to those who were held captive in Abraham's bosom and led captivity captive. They were They were there because they couldn't enter the presence of God. And then he shows them his wounds and preaches to them. And they see that he's the one and he leads them them out of there. When he's raised, they were raised with him, as well as all of us who believe. So uh, my answer would be false. Uh-huh. All right. Ben, I've been looking for the poll results. I haven't seen it show up yet. I just put them on the screen. I just put, put them up. Uh, pretty much everyone said certainly true. Oh, I'm sorry. One person said certainly true. One person said undecided. One said leaning false. And nine said certainly false. Hello? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to find the poll. I can't find it anywhere on the screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I should say um, YouTube is reporting that the stream is the choppy. And it looks like it's kind of a little bit choppy to me, too. But I am getting a backup copy, so it'll be flawless when I upload it. Um, but either way, people could still uh, still hear us uh, clearly, and yeah. that should be fine. And All right. Okay. Uh, could you give me again the, the results of the poll? Okay. One said certainly true. One said undecided. One said leading false. And nine said certainly false. Okay. Ben, was you, were you did you say certainly true? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. You better teach us then. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to probably say something here that's probably going to uh, ruffle some feathers. I know some, some people in the congregation. Uh, Lisa, I think you and I are on the same page on this. Um, but um, let me just go over. I'm going to read some quotes here because uh, uh, this is something I've been researching. Um, okay, uh, I think we have all uh, understand that you're either uh, uh, born twice and die once or born once and die twice. We know about the second death. Um, And I I would challenge anyone to, for every uh, reference in the Bible that refers to death, if you read it carefully, death in the Bible never means cessation of existence. It always means separation. Uh, And so uh, I think, in fact, we see this early on. And so the reason I mentioned that, uh, the, the controversy is that 
uh, eternal torment versus, uh, you know, or annihilationism. And again, just in the Bible, when I, when I see death in the Bible, it never means cessation of existence. It means separation. And the context it determines what the separation is all about. But let me just so uh, that probably already shut a lot of people's ears off already. And that's uh, unfortunate. So, I, uh, so just hear me out for the rest of this. Um, so death in the Bible does not mean cessation of existence, but separation. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he did not cease to exist, but something changed immediately in his relationship with God. Adam died spiritually. As a result, he tried to hide from God, Genesis 3, 8 to 10. God had warned Adam previously, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you, sh you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did Adam die in the day that he ate? Was God's word literally fulfilled? Yes, Adam died spiritually in the sense of being separated in his relationship with God. Obviously, Adam did not die physically that day since Genesis 5.5 5 states that he went on to live hundreds of years before dying at the age of three, uh, 930. But as soon as Adam sinned, he died immediately in a spiritual sense toward God, and he began the long, slow process of bodily degeneration under the curse, leading to physical death hundreds of years later. The example of Adam helps us, helps us to see how it was possible for Christ to be physically alive on the cross while at the same time undergoing a spiritual death or or judicial separation from God the Father. Um, this is also in uh, illustrated in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, where it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Like the Ephesians before their salvation, all of us were in a state of spiritual deadness toward God in our trespasses and sins before salvation, and we were under the wrath of God. Um, in fact, I, I think that's part of the reason um, why there's so much uh, interest in zombies, because, you know, an unregenerate person is really a walking dead in, in God's eyes. Um, so from God's perspective, before our regeneration, we were all spiritually dead men walking. Thus, spiritual death refers to the condition of being separated from a right standing or relationship before God while still being physically alive. The Bible not only speaks of spiritual death in terms of separation rather than non-existence, it also describes physical, physical death as separation, the separation of the soul and spirit from the body. And that's in, uh, also also uh, indicated in Genesis 35, 18. Um, so, uh, and also too, it, it's also illustrated in James 2, 26, where, where uh, James says, in reference to an ongoing walk of faith in the Christian life that results in uh, beneficial works for others, it says, for the for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It doesn't mean faith never existed. It just means it's not, uh, it's separated from its intended object, which is good works uh, in, in that context. Um, okay, I could go on to, on to much more, um, but I, I'll wrap it up right with, with one more statement, because I could give you a lot more evidence and it, it you know, I think it's, it's for me, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, but uh, this is. Uh, um, oh, I'm just trying. OK, so when, Matt, when, when Christ was died on the cross, um, Jesus. Uh, OK, so of, of Christ's seven sayings from the cross recorded in the Gospels, only once did he quote scripture. Matthew 27, 45 through 46 states now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. There was a darkness over the, all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, 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 lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, and then it says, some who deny that the spiritual aspect of Christ's death claim that he only intended this statement as a figurative expression of his physical agony and that he was simply reciting this verse to the crowd assembled at Calvary, not crying out directly and personally to God. But this interpretation seems hollow in light of the particular verse Jesus chose to quote when he spoke it. Christ chose to quote Psalm 22, 1 was significant. Out of the 23,145 verses in the Old Testament, he chose just one that precisely conveyed what he was experiencing at the moment in his personal relationship with God the Father. Uh, okay. 
Of the 31 verses in Psalm 22, there are many that fulfill the objective of describing the crucifixion in vivid detail, yet do not contain speech directed personally to God, as in verse 1. Psalm 22 uses the word forsaken or conveys as strongly the idea that the Son of God was separated from the Father on the cross. Christ did not quote Psalm 22 during the three hours of his crucifixion, but yelled it out during his last hours of life during the hours of darkness when God the Father was pouring out his wrath on the judgment of his own son. And here's a beautiful uh, statement out the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll finish here. Um, J. Vernon McGee explains this unique nature of this death. He says, he did not die as martyrs who in their deaths sang praises of joy and confessed that Christ was standing by them. Our Lord didn't die like that. He was forsaken by God. He said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? His death was different. He died alone, alone with the sins of the world upon him. We see the man, Christ Jesus, on the cross as the perfect man. He had learned to rest upon God. He had learned to trust him in all that he had, he did. He said, I do always the things that my, I do always those things that please him. But yonder in that desperate and despairing hour, he was abandoned of God. There was no place to turn either on the human plane or on the divine. He had no place to go. The man Christ Jesus was forsaken. No other ever has had to experience that. No one. He alone, the father was with him when he was being beaten. The father was with him when they did look to the cross. But in those last three hours, he made his soul an offering for sin, and it pleased the father to bruise him. Forsaken, my friend, you, you do not know what that is, and I do not know what that, what it is to be forsaken of God. The vilest man on this earth today is not forsaken of God. Anyone can turn to him. But when Christ makes, takes my sin upon himself, he is forsaken of God. Why hast thou forsaken me? It is not why of is it is not the why of impatience, it is the why of despair. It is not the why of doubt, it is the human cry of intense suffering, aggravated by the anguish of his innocent and holy life, that awful and agonizing cry of the loneliness of his passion. He was alone, he was alone with the sins of the world upon him. Why art thou so far from helping me and from my, from the words of my roaring? Psalm twenty two one. Roaring, yes, at his trial he was silent. As a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. When they beat him, he said nothing. When they nailed him to the cross, he did not whimper. But when God forsook him, he roared like a lion. It was a roar of pain. Um, and there's other various other scriptures that back up that uh, idea that, uh, again, uh, I just think it makes logical sense that he had to, uh, the second death is, physical death is, yes, the uh, wages of sin, but the second death is is as well. Hell owns you, basically. And so Christ had to uh, feed that gaping maw of death uh, in our place. And so I do, I, believe, I do believe he died spiritually. Again, it doesn't mean ceasing to exist. It just means separated temporarily from God the Father. Mm -hmm. And again, after the resurrection, he was uh, rejoined. That's my view. All right. Let me respond first. Uh First, let me respond to your, your uh, methodology here, uh, not your substance. Um, I really don't think it's a good idea uh, in this format to make that kind of a presentation where you're reading uh, commentaries to the, to the group. I would much prefer that you just uh, speak uh, extemporaneously as the rest of us are. Um, I, I know I don't like listening to someone read uh, I'd rather I want to get your thoughts rather than uh, listening to someone read for any length of time uh, so that's I do have uh, an objection to that as far as your conclusion um, the idea of um, um, uh, the death at the garden uh, I don't disagree that uh, the Spirit of God withdrew from Adam and Eve and they died that day spiritually but to make the claim that um, uh, this is, you've heard me make this point with uh, other people who do this, and I, I think it's a, a mistake uh, most of the time uh, to, to make a, a claim that's an absolute, the way you are, that, uh, that death always means separation uh, rather than non-existence. 
I, I think making that kind of claim is a very risky, dangerous thing to do, and I would caution against it, um, especially since we don't have the time and it's not the place to try to, you know, debate it out. <clears throat> All I would say in, in response to the actual um, conclusion of death always being separation, uh, I would just refer everybody to the playlist and the videos that I've made and Renee has joined me several times in these talks about uh, the fact that uh, the uh, this this second death for, for the lost is uh, extermination no longer existing. So you'd have to watch all the videos that we've made uh, to make that point and see all the verses that we use to make our case. Uh, so I disagree with your conclusion, but I also, as I said, I prefer that you uh, dialogue with us the same way we're doing instead of reading something uh, the way you did. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say a lot of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, I look back on that now. I, didn't, I got carried away. I would, um, say, I would say to everybody, I would ask everybody in the future, if you do want to read something, try to make sure you're reading something that's no longer than, you know, 30 seconds maybe. Uh, it's just for right. the sake of everybody and so that we have the conversation going instead of it becomes into a, a lecture by one person. Yeah, okay. I wasn't trying to lecture. Again, I wasn't being dogmatic. I'm not saying, hey, if you don't believe that, uh, I'm not going to fellowship with you. I'm not saying that. And I think a lot of people say absolute yeah, things on here. Well, but, I, meant, I meant lecture in terms of one. there's one speaker rather than a group conversation. I agree. I, I, agree. I got carried away and I apologize. So, All right. Okay. Um, anybody, anybody else want to respond to it, any of the points that he made? Um, I, I I don't agree, but that's okay. I mean, we all have uh, different b beliefs. Um, that's okay. I, I don't I don't I don't think that he died spiritually. It was God. So God God can't die. So if the part of him that's God is his spirit, his spirit definitely didn't die. Uh, in in my it's my opinion that he didn't die. He died physically for our sins. That's that's how he had to die. Um, I don't disagree that that uh, God turned his back on him in the moment of uh, a moment of cruc crucifixion. I mean, there there that seems pretty clear. Um, uh, so he felt alone. Uh, he felt abandoned. I'm sure. I mean, he he says as much that he felt, "Why have you forsaken me?" And that not only to just quote scripture, but uh, I'm sure that's how he felt. Um, well, isn't that spiritual death then? Is it isn't that spiritual death? Uh, not in the way that I that I term it. No, I mean his spirit isn't dying; it's God turning his back on him uh, because of the sin that he's carrying. I mean that that's what it, that's what it seems like to me. It's not a spiritual it's not a spiritual death in terms of the the part of him that's God died. He's still God. It it, it was a physical death, and just because. If God turns your back on someone, doesn't mean that you're spiritually dead. I mean, the Adam and Eve part is compelling, but they're not God. Uh, they have no part of them that's God. So it's it's to me, it's a completely different different scenario. You can't compare Adam and Eve and the way that they died spiritually when they sinned to Jesus, in my opinion. Just my opinion, though. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, I have something I'd like to say. Ben, I'd be very interested in getting your notes on that. I'd like to review that um, because that's an interesting perspective to be forsaken and separated as a uh, spiritual death because you and I do not believe in annihilation. And I, I've made no no uh, qualms about that. That's not hidden. Um, so I, I would be interested in, in in hearing and seeing more about that. The, uh, everything that you were just saying you were doing it quite rapidly so I wasn't able to take it all in but I would be interested in reviewing that and, and placing that upon scripture and some other things I've seen in scripture as well mm -hmm. uh, right. do you want to read the comments uh, yeah go ahead unless it, someone else wants to any, anybody else want to say, uh, say any more Paula Angel anybody more okay go ahead Ben all right. I, again, I, I want to apologize for I, I did get carried away. I didn't uh, mean to monopolize it. The time went by faster than I thought. And the main thing I wanted to get to was that Vernon Mc, J. Vernon McGee quote, which I thought was incredible, um, very moving and very uh, real. Um, so, OK, so uh, Laura Stubbs says Christ died once. Uh, someone else says undecided. He left his majesty 
I'm sorry, he left his majestic glory in heaven, might be a form of death to come to earth and die on a cross. Another person says, Don, uh, Don Carnage says, yes, yes, when he flew to pirate. Ah, never mind. Sorry about that. Um, so that those are the comments. Okay. All right. Unless there's more, let's go to the next question. Okay. Um, okay. The next question is true or false. I religiously follow the Ten Commandments. Okay. All right. I, uh, I submitted the question, so I'll, I'll go last. Uh, anybody ready to answer it? Well, I've gone first every time, so I'll take a back seat on this one. <laughs> right. Oh, no, Cripps, you got to go first again. <laughs> no, I'll go first on this one because I always have fun with the, all the zealots that want to. Uh, I religiously follow. I don't know if you religiously really depends on how that word's being used. <laughs> but um, I'm going to say false, but with a good excuse. <laughs> uh, because, okay, Jeremiah 31, 31. I love referring to that because it's in the Old Covenant. And then it is recited almost verbatim in the book of Hebrews in the New Covenant. And it talks about the law is going to be written. It was a promise in Jeremiah that he was going to take away our stony heart and give us a heart of clay and that the law would be written upon our hearts, which is exactly what happens. And as I've said before, that's why really anybody who's born again, they they don't need a whip and stick. The Holy Spirit is right there with you and you don't get away with anything. I mean, he immediately deals with you the moment I mean, you even know the moment you sinned because, because there's this keen awareness and you feel it. You feel it within your soul. So, uh, you know, we don't we don't need anybody coming around with a whip and stick. Now, people who are hardened in their heart, that's like I said, that's still unless you have a personal relationship with them and you can clearly see that they were engaged in some form of sin and you uh, could speak into their life because you know them, your family, your friends, whatever. Uh, otherwise, we should, first, first of all, we should be praying for them anyway. But second, you know, that's still you need to seek the Lord before you even open your mouth because you don't want to do more harm than good. If the Lord is dealing with them, you can mess something up. I mean, I literally had a time that the Lord, I was going to say something to someone about something I had observed about them personally that I knew wasn't right. And the Lord told me, don't you say it because I'm dealing with this person. And if you say that, you're going to mess her up and it's going to take me years to, to get her back. That's what he said. I closed my mouth. I went, I literally opened to take the breath to say it. And he said that to me in an instant and I closed my mouth. So, you know, that's why I just get so irritated with all these sin chasers and people who want to finger wag. Now, there's a time and a place, certainly, to admonish brothers and sisters who are in error. Absolutely. But this whole thing where people run around being individual fruit inspectors, trying to chastise people when the Lord has not, one, number one, instructed them to do it. And two, uh, you know, they're just kind of taking it upon themselves to be, you know, the fruit inspector, you know, champion of the world. And it's just it's thoroughly annoying. It's, they really do not trust the Holy Spirit to do his job. And that's what I don't understand. If you know God is real, you don't have to do that. And if somebody is in darkness on a topic as a believer where they've been convinced that something isn't sin that clearly is, which there are some rare instances like that. And I just pray for them, Father, open their eyes that they might see, you know, that the Holy Spirit is the best teacher in the world. So. You know, that's why I said, you know, false with a, with a good excuse, because I don't go, oh, let me see what the Ten Commandments are and let me make sure I'm not violating them. He's written his law upon my heart. It's not my desire to violate any of his commandments. And uh, if I even get close, there's a warning about it almost immediately. You know, a check in my spirit about stuff. So. That's why I, I had to say, you know, false, but with a good excuse. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Who's next? Um, I'll go next. Um, I mean, my answer is similar to Lisa's. I also wonder what the questioner meant by religiously. Um, it can mean either having to do with your religion or doing something with some sort of consistent uh, regularity. Right. Um, so my answer would be yes and no. Uh, yes, there's a part of me that keeps the law perfectly. It's the sinless part of me. It's the reason why I get to go to heaven. It's because I have Jesus's righteousness on me. And when God sees me, um, in a sense, he doesn't see any sin on me. So in a sense, yeah. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I'll sometimes find myself coveting without realizing it. But like Lisa said, the law is written on our hearts. So it's not like you're going to get away with it anymore. <laughs> like when I was unsaved, it wasn't uh, wrong to covet. That's just how people are. That's how we get ahead in life, right? Keeping up with the Joneses. That's what everybody does. Um, so it didn't really bother me. But now, of course, it does. Um, I am very adamant about certain things, like not lying, not stealing, not even like little, little white lies. I was just talking to a friend the other day how sometimes you can um, – sort of justify your lie in your head a little bit, you know, and say, well, it wasn't really a lie because you have this big elaborate explanation. <laughs> but from the other person's point of view, it absolutely was a lie. Uh, I, I'm hypersensitive to that, consciously aware of that. Um, but um, so yes and no. Yes, I, I follow it religiously because it's part of my religion um, and also follow it religiously as in, uh, you know, a type of regularity because it's always with me because the Lord is always with me. Even if I have a temporary lapse in judgment, I have his spirit inside of me that tells me something's not right. You know, did, what did you just do? It makes me take heed to myself. It makes me look upon myself and see myself through his eyes. So um, my answer was uh, leaning true. All right. Good answer. All right. Okay. Brother Cripps, what do you say then? Um, well, I, I liked Paul's answer. So I'll just say ditto. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the spirit man doesn't sin. So in that way, yes, uh, we, we follow uh, the Ten Commandments perfectly, but um, on the flesh side, absolutely not. I mean, if if I was able to keep the Ten Commandments, let's say that I'm under the Ten Commandments in the first place, uh, uh, then uh, I would have no sin if I was able to follow them, quote unquote, religiously. Again, it does depend on how that word is used. I don't like the word. Uh, when people say, oh, are you religious? I'm not, not at all. I'm not religious. Um, uh, but answering in terms of the way the question is, is formed, I would, would also say leaning true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ben? Um, I said certainly false uh, because um, the... Well, in Romans 7, for example, Paul says that the focusing on the law arouses sin in the flesh and it, it causes you, it, it, the law came about to increase sin uh, and focusing on the uh, law would uh, arouse sin in the flesh and uh, make of it even worse than he would have had he not focused on the law when he wasn't, when he was walking by the spirit. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, they're good principles. I mean, but I, again, with the Holy Spirit, you don't. You, I, I think we know well and good what what God wants and what he what he likes and he doesn't. And those are our our they should be our likes and uh, things that we want to do. You know, the the law says you must, whereas grace says you should based on who you are. And so, whenever I kind of feel like I'm obligated to do something, I really question myself. Okay, maybe it's just best I don't even do it. Um, Unless it's obviously, uh, you know, 
essential. Um, but uh, again, uh, I I try to uh, I try to allow the spirit to lead as much as possible. Um, and that's I know that's not always easy. Um, it's it's an active I think it's an active mindset. It's setting your mind on the things of the spirit as it opposed to setting things on the law. Um, because if you if you're focused on things of the law, you cannot please God because you're in the flesh. If you're focused on the spirit, things of the spirit, um, the fruit of the spirit, and, and developing uh, those type of characteristics, as I think are given in by Peter in First Peter, uh, I'm sorry, Second Peter one, uh, we we says add uh, build on your most holy faith, build yourself up. Uh, those are the things that uh, I try to uh, you know I I try to be led by the spirit. If I ever feel like okay, hey, am I am I doing am I Am I pleasing God? I, I look and say, okay, am I in in uh, in am I in not? I wouldn't say in my compliance, but am I am I in harmony with these principles? So, yeah, right. yeah. Um, I'll uh, I'll say, but Ben kind of Ben's answer kind of blended the two together for me with uh, with Paula's answer. Um, I uh, I don't uh, religiously. I, I you know whatever that word means keep uh, keep the Ten Commandments, but I do use them as a if I feel out of sync or I feel out of touch somewhat with the, with the, with the Holy spirit, um, if I get caught up or busy or something like, you know, sometimes I'll, they're like the thighs often refers to as sort of keeping the Ten commandments, like you keep the stars. And I really like that metaphor. Um, I would say that, you know, at least in a carnal level, that's, uh, you know, I'll find myself if I'm trying to make a decision or, or sort of judge people's not judge, sort of kind of assess, uh, where someone else is at, I'll, I might refer to the Ten Commandments um, as guiding principles. Um, but uh, really, it's the Holy Spirit that uh, tends to tends to help guide me along. I mean, I, I can usually feel uh, inside whether or not um, whether or not I'm in fellowship with God the way that I would like to be. And it's usually more about an issue of being honest with yourself. I think. I think more than anything else, it seems like. A, a, uh, denial and um, self delusion and uh, uh, self pity and things like that can get in the way um, uh, of your uh, connection with God and your uh, your walk um, as a, as a believer. Then uh, you know the, these uh, well, laws and ordinances. Um, uh, but uh, so I would say uh, leaning false, leaning false. At least on a carnal level, spiritually, yes, of course, I keep it all perfectly. I'm perfect. Never, no, nobody's ever been any uh, more perfect than me because uh, Jesus Christ is, is perfect, and and He did it for me. So, mm. Mm. okay, thank you. All right, well, uh, I submitted the question, and I wrote it in a particular way on purpose. Uh, the word "religiously" is an uh, important part of the question. But first, let me address just the concept of the Ten Commandments and uh, the, the, the problem that I see with the Ten Commandments. Uh, I think almost universally in Christendom, the Ten Commandments are embraced as part of the church. Uh, and and uh, obviously, the Ten Commandments are perfect and beautiful. But most people in the church, I doubt very many people at all, realize that the Ten Commandments, along with all the other laws, of Mosaic laws, were given to Israel. Um, there is no place in the Bible that says that the, uh, any of the laws of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, were given to the Gentile world. And in fact, Paul says that we were not, Gentiles were not under this law, but they were under the conscience. Um, so, at the fall, of course, um, Adam and Eve, uh, they died spiritually when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They, uh, uh, they knew what good and evil was. They knew right and wrong. And, and uh, I believe that is part of the curse, that, and it was, it's passed down to all of us. Uh, every descendant of Adam and Eve knows right and wrong innately uh, with, a con with their conscience. So... For the world as a whole, we're under conscience, not uh, the laws of, of Israel. Uh, so that, that's the first part of the problem with this question. And the idea of um, uh, using the, uh, the laws of Moses, even the Ten, uh, and, and applying it to the church. The church should be uh, uh, basically just 
Jesus condensed it all in and simplified it all, saying just love God and love love your fellow man. Uh, and if you do that, then you're you've you followed all the laws, really. Um, but the the reason I put the word religiously in there is because uh, uh, as as I define religiously, and I know that we can probably look up the word and find several definitions. But the way I've always defined religion is a, a re, all religions are basically the same. And I don't count Christianity as a religion. But uh, you, you take all the religions of the world and they have this one thing in common. It's, it's, they all have established some kind of a system, uh, of a, a, a list of do's and don'ts that you need to follow in order to make yourself acceptable to God. Um, so, matter of fact, uh, the, one of our truisms is, is that religion says do, Jesus says done. Uh, I think I got that one from Sister Lisa also. We got a lot of profound truisms from her. So, uh, religion says do, do, do. And that's what you end up with, a bunch of do, do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you, are, if you are following the Ten Commandments uh, as part of a religion saying, I need to do these things, then we know that that's uh, the, the heretical doctrine of uh, works salvation. Um, so for those two reasons, I said uh, certainly false. I don't ever think about following the, the commandments of um, Moses. And uh, I, I just try to listen to the Holy Spirit that's trying to change my mind and re renew my mind. And, and the Holy Spirit's done a great work on me. He's changed a lot of my desires in life and changed my temperament to, to, to a great extent. Amen. All right. Um, anybody else want to add more to that question? I just would like to ask, when you say um, with the Gentiles being um, under sort of the law of conscience, now, uh, I have said that too, and sometimes people will ask me, so did they go to heaven? Did they just have to not violate their own conscience? And I was just, I don't know, I'd like to, I was wondering if that's what you, do you believe that, or is there a way to know that? Um, uh, it's, it's a, no. I've, I've, I've had people give me like a gotcha moment when they when I when I say that before. Well, until uh, uh, Jacob, uh, there was no Israel. Until Judah, there were no Jews. So everybody before that, uh, how did all of the other uh, uh, great um, figures of the Bible uh, of, of our faith? Uh, did, how did they go to heaven? They they had faith in the true God and that God would provide uh, uh, salvation for them. And that has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They didn't know that this salvation, would, how, who would do it and, and exactly how it would be accomplished. Those are things that were gradually revealed through uh, progressive revelation. Uh, and uh, uh, now it's all been revealed. The revelation's complete. So we have a complete picture and we can look back in hindsight and see it all clearly. Back then it was more vague, the shadows and pictures of what we know has already been accomplished. Uh, so the Gentiles, um, yeah, uh, Abraham was a Gentile. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, everybody before uh, Abraham, they, they were Gentiles. That's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, I, I think I heard somebody else uh, um I'm sure it was biblical literalist, literalist or who it was, but she said something uh, along the lines of um, uh, that, uh, at least uh, prior to, uh, I'm trying to remember, actually, basically the Gentiles, um, uh, they just had to basically believe that, that, you know, that there was a God of some sort. Um, and uh, I guess that, that was really the more the question. Obviously, I, I don't think that we're, anybody was ever saved by not violating their own conscience. That's not kind of what I meant. I, she, she kind of described it in a certain way where it was like, you know, she, she used the verse about, you know, the, the, you know, being a law unto yourself. And then also the, uh, the idea of just a vague notion of God without actually having it perfectly understood. I don't know. It might be a cool question for next time, actually, to figure out, uh, what, 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 you know, I, I'm always trying to understand this better. But, uh, you know, when because people will, especially unbelievers, will kind of corner me with this question about basically, um, so basically everybody went to hell, you know, until such and such a time in the Bible. But anyway, uh, th yeah, thank you, though. That's a, that's a really great way of putting it uh, when you talk about the, the Ten Commandments. I think some people, like I, for me, I was a little bit uh, hesitant to, to, to 
you know, kind of go as, as far as you did, but I think you, you, you justified it perfectly. Cause that's kind of how my, instinctually that's how I feel too. Um, uh, but I am always afraid of people hearing it wrong and thinking that I'm yeah. saying, Oh, you can do whatever you want. And that's not what I'm in at all. So thanks yeah. like, for explaining it. <laughs> I, uh, thank you. But uh, and you, I'm sure you already know this, uh, but another mistake uh, as far as how people view these commandments, um, not only were they for Israel, but even Israel, where the, the commandments were not intended to be a means of salvation, the, the of commandments, course. if you read the Old Testament, when it references, if they follow the law, what happens? It talks about they're going to be blessed. They're, they'll have crops. They'll reach a, uh, you know, this pro promised country or whatever. They, but they're not, they never promised them eternal life or heaven. Right, right, right. And, and mostly know, it was supposed to stop your mouth. Yeah, and we also know that. Keep if they were trying to uh, uh, attain eternal life through following these commandments, they were, they're doomed to failure because no one's been able to do it perfectly. So that's foolishness. The verse that talks about the conscience, I'll read here. It just says, uh, Romans 2, 14, uh, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, so we naturally do these things anyway without having the law. These, having not the law, or a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So this is how the Gentiles know right and wrong. Uh, we, we just have a conscience. But God went to the Israel and says, you are going to make you such a peculiar people. You're going to stand out like a sore thumb. I'm going to have the Messiah come through your lineage. And so I'm going to... I'm going to write the law in writing for you. I'll even write it in stone with my own finger. Uh, whereas with us, he gave us a conscience. It was harder on them. I've said that before. It's harder on them. It was actually, it was a higher standard. Uh, it was a break, in my opinion. Uh, well, again, I was going to quote that uh, Romans 2 also, is that uh, anyone who says they haven't defied, uh, uh, defied their content is a liar i mean that uh romans 2 clearly makes sense in fact that's a point of romans 2 i believe that actually romans 1 2 through 3 is basically suggesting is, is kind of summarizing uh man's kind's all, all of mankind's just uh condemnation because the the jews didn't keep the law even though they had it and the 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 uh gentiles didn't have it but they they didn't even follow their own consciences um and so uh, you know, that's why God is just in his condemnation. And that's why he, he's basically saying, hey, this, especially Romans 1, I believe, where he talks about all the all the sins that people do. And people always kind of zero in on the homosexuality one. But there's backbiting is in there. Uh, all, all kinds of, quote, unquote, minor sins, people would say, are in there. And um, it's just it, it's just showing that there's universal condemnation across the board. And that's why we all need a savior. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, any more from anybody, or uh, do we have some comments, uh, Ben? Yeah, let me read those. We have two of them. Um, Laura Stubb says, we are not under the law. Uh, second person says, that is just religious, lol, or laugh out loud. Though I do love the commands of God, I cannot live up to them. Praise Jesus, that did. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, let's go to the next question. Okay. The next question is, um, no, I don't think, I think it's just okay. If we mentioned this is Autumn's question. And it, I think it's a great question. Awesome question. Um, and it is there, let me put before I paste it here. Um, there are always negative consequences to sin. True or false? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Ben, why don't you go first on this one? Uh, I, I need to get the stuff posted up. So uh, can you give me, skip me for one more? Just skip me once. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Brother Cripps? Um, hmm. uh, I mean, there's, there's the obvious answer, I think, which, should, which, uh, you know, like, of course, uh, Okay, I'm going to read it just to make sure. There's always a negative consequence to sin. Um, I would say certainly true. I mean, there, 
all sin, there's a negative consequence because Christ had to die. Um, so a consequence was was fully paid. Uh, if the if the person that asked the question is thinking, um, you know, sometimes we we sin and get away with it. Well, I, I don't I don't think we do. I mean, I know that there are some things that I have done where there was no known consequence, like uh, quote unquote got away with it. Um, but looking back at it now and i still remember those things that i did that maybe nobody caught the lie that i told that was never discovered or you know stealing a piece of uh penny gum uh from the five and dime store that tells you how old i am they used to have those still when i was a kid the five and dime stores uh and and no one caught me um i even paid a consequence because when God started working in my heart and spirit, I remembered those things that I did and felt the consequences of my actions. So I, I would say uh, uh, certainly true. There's always a negative consequence to sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Uh, how about Sister Paula? Um, I answered certainly true. Um, I don't think that there can be sin any kind of sin committed and then it's just neutral um there's always some sort of negative i think that's just the nature of sin that's it's sort of like um you know god saying uh if you obey me you'll get blessings if you disobey me you'll get cursings um i just think that's the the natural consequence to sin is always negative and it's always there. Whether we see it or not, like Jason was saying, we may think we're getting away with it, but we're not really. I mean, and, you know, the reason why God told us not to do certain things and to do certain things were for our good, for our benefit. So, you know, like we can sin <laughs> and think we're getting away with it. Um, but I don't think that we ever do. I think it uh, builds upon one upon another. I mean, sin just brings forth more sin. Uh, Sister Paula, can I interrupt just for a second? Uh, because people are noticing that the screen is frozen. I just want to bring that to Ben's attention uh, and make him aware of it. All right, go ahead, Sister. Yeah, I noticed that too. And I clicked on it and I the audio is still going. I think it's buffering a little bit, so it's way behind. Like what I'm looking at now is aud or not aud Angel's picture. Yeah. So that, that's a while ago. Me too. Um, but that was pretty much all I wanted to say that's certainly true. Even if we don't know, even if we can't see the consequences ourselves, it, there, there is some sort of negative consequence going out, whether other people see it, whether it puffs up us up, whether it leads to more sin, which it usually does. Um, there's always something negative going to come from it. Sort of like a cause and effect. You know, you can't have a cause without the effect. You're always going to have some sort of effect, even if you don't see, see it or recognize it. So. Yeah. Except for the uncaused cause. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know who or what the uncaused cause is? No, what's that? God. Everything has a cause. Uh, if it, everything that exists has a cause, but if you regress it back and back, it has to be at some point an uncaused cause, and that's God who didn't have a, a cause. It was not, there was nothing that caused God to exist when it happened. Interesting. That's something to chew on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought you might have known about that already. You're so you're so uh, knowledgeable and profound. No, not really. I'm not. But no, I I had never heard of that. But he mm -hmm. he did cause quite an effect, though, didn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Let me see. Uh, who's uh, next? I don't remember who spoke so far. Uh, if Ben could go, because I am right by my rooster real quick. Uh, right. If I talk right now, I'll be right back. I'll be right away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yes, I, I would say that's true. Even, you know, white lies, it, it is a difficult situation because we're sinners. And it, it, because we're all sinners, 
sometimes you feel like you do need to lie to someone so that they don't, you know, say for example, uh, my spouse says, do I look fat in this? You know, that's the classic example. And I say, Oh no, you look wonderful, dear. Well, it, 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 it maybe she did look fat in it, you know, for example, um, it, it would, uh, First of all, it's my opinion, so it's not really an objective statement. But if I were to give my opinion, if I if I uh, misconstrued my opinion, then that would be a sin. But at the same time, you know, if I if if we were not all sinners, I could say to her, "Yes, you do," and she wouldn't, uh, be, you know, her vanity wouldn't be offended by it. You know, see, okay, I, I must, I, I am fat in it, so I will, um, you know, I, I will. Uh, Oh, it is what it is, or you know, whatever she may do, uh, she may do choose to do something about it or not. Oh boy, what did I get myself into? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you guys, uh, yeah. So I, 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 there always is a negative consequence, but sometimes from a female perspective, you could either be like, "All right, bad outfit," or you could be like, oh, "I'm gonna work out some" or something like that. You didn't do anything wrong, Ben. It's totally reasonable for men to to think this way. <laughs> Women are the unreasonable ones. <laughs> Get oh, really upset. Get me wrong. <laughs> I, I, I can't stop sitting in that respect. I will. I will tell someone. I'm not going to be the. You know, give someone the blatant. Um, what I'm really thinking when it when it's critical, I'm always uh, you know sh- trying to sugarcoat as much as possible, uh, but I'm not great at that. As you guys probably already know that I, I kind of I don't I speak as I'm thinking, and that's one of my problems. Um, that's not a problem. That's all being honest. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, it, so they're always for me. It's like okay, when you know, lots of you're trying to give someone, they ask you for your opinion. You uh, you you have. Uh, you either tell them how it is, and that that could be in some ways construed sinful because I'm I'm not big loving, you know. It, I'm, I'm being honest, but I'm not big loving, so it's a sin to not uh, see them uh, as the way Christ would see them. For example, uh, at the other hand, um, the uh, the fact that I tell them, uh, you know, uh, that I try to sugarcoat it, that also uh, is is not truthful, and so it's a sin in that respect. It's a lesser of two sins, you might say, or uh, or the greater of two sins, but um, yes, I see in, in general, uh, as an absolute statement, sin always, uh, has negative consequences. Um, some sins have uh, lesser consequences than others. And unfortunately we live in a fallen world. So sometimes we have to choose the lesser of two sins, just like with every election, the lesser of two evils. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. I'm having a hard time remembering who's taken a turn. So wh- whoever hasn't answered, go ahead. Did Ben, did you say just like in the election, the lesser of two? Yes. Okay, I just want to, I just want, I wasn't sure I heard that right. Um, that was funny. Uh, I said certainly true, and uh, that's because you know the Bible says that uh, when someone when you sin that it it when it's conceived it brings forth death. And I think it was Brother Cripps when he was speaking, he was saying that, you know, when you do sin, he didn't phrase it this way, but basically this is what he was saying. There, there's regrets in, in, in many regards. And then you got to deal with your conscience bothering you. And then you have to deal with the devil accusing you. And, you know, um, it's just a myriad of, of things that get lobbed at you and things that you have to deal with, not to mention if there are any you know, ramifications here in the natural, certain things have consequences. Um, even though uh, God may not be coming to get you, there are spiritual laws also that are a- at play. And some of them are unavoidable. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for example, I mean, this is just, I'm just using this, not, not to condemn anybody, just as an example, if a, a person... Uh, were to fornicate or commit adultery, and then a child is the result of that sexual union, now you have something you're going to be dealing with for the rest of your life. <laughs> so there is, uh, there are ramifications for our actions. And it's not that anybody's being punished. Uh, there are spiritual things that go into play. And so that's why we have to be very careful. And the Bible tells us to guard our affections for out of them are the issues of life. 
some of us have been burned by that more than once <laughs> so we can we can definitely say amen uh we wish we would have listened <laughs> we have regrets i'm always puzzled by these people that uh say they get to the end of their life and say they don't have any regrets i never understand that because i haven't lived all of my life and i have some and uh, if i could go back and uh, have a do-over i would definitely do it over not again but avoiding that and not falling into that because there was a heavy price to pay so uh you know it's certainly true in, in my opinion and in this regard there are scriptures that say exactly that and uh while there are times that you did something and you wipe your forehead like cuz you know you know if god would have smacked you for that you know you might not be here if he would have allowed you to get caught doing something you ain't had no business or uh and i'm talking about since you've been a believer or you you know made a mistake and you really stepped into something and the lord literally just kept you through the whole thing and you're like wow you know the goodness and grace of god because i deserve to get smacked for that and you didn't get smacked so it's, it's like wow and then other times he lets you go through <laughs> if you will the fiery furnace he gets through but but you feel the heat so uh it's just better if you can not to sin, you know, yeah. it's, just, it's better. <laughs> it's way better. Amen. Yes, I would, I would agree. I would agree. It's certainly true. Um, I, I've been thinking about it and thinking about it and I can't think of a, of a single situation in which, um, uh, a sin doesn't have a natural, uh, earthly consequence. Um, even just in the form of, of guilt. Uh, I know for me, um, uh, uh, in the past, when I was lost, uh, I would have argued with you. I really would. I would have argued with you that uh, there was nothing wrong with a white lie, <laughs> like a lie of convenience, like literally just uh, making up a reason why you had to go, why you could, why you missed your doctor's appointment, or something like that, because uh, because otherwise, you you know, even if it was perfectly valid, <laughs> like you know, something was really beyond your control, unless you I don't know left an hour before you needed to get there, you, they, they wouldn't have cared. You make up something so you don't have to pay a you know a fifty dollar late fee or something like that. And you know, uh, I would have argued in the past when I had no um, real spiritual barometer that uh, that there was nothing wrong with that. Um, whereas I, once I got and even honestly leading up to the point I got saved. Um, I, I realized that even every little lie like that cost me something. It cost me the feeling of like having integrity. Um, when I moved away from Florida, especially because, uh, Florida people lie a lot. <laughs> people lie all the Just time. Just Florida? Uh, and I, <laughs> yeah, Florida. <laughs> well, I mean, I've noticed that people are less comfortable with lying here in Indiana. I have definitely noticed that people people have a little bit more of integrity here in India. It's it's I'm not just it, it's noticeable. So no, I'm not obviously they could be lying in small ways that I'm not aware of. But I encounter flagrant liars a lot less than I do than I did in Florida all my life growing up there. Um, here, there's sort of a more of a there's a it's intact still this sense of honor. Um, or um, so like a, people might call it the Protestant work ethic and the product, you know, just sort of a, uh, in, in, in Florida, it was, I mean, there's a reason that there's a meme called Florida man. I'm telling you, there's a, <laughs> there's some real cultural and spiritual decay going on in Florida. And, um, uh, you know, moving here, uh, I realized that, um, that this, this feeling that I had where I was, I felt cleaner even before I got saved. I felt I felt like I didn't even realize the depravity I was, you know, surrounded by all my life in Key West. I mean, I knew it was was bad, but uh, I didn't realize just how sick uh, the society was there that I was used to, and um, and that's when I started to identify that that honesty and honor and integrity, which is really um, like the, the the biggest things that made me fall so in love with my husband, who's from Indiana, and I met in Florida. 
um, <laughs> when I, when, you know, I was, I, na- I was just madly in love with him. And it was because of those qualities that I wasn't used to. Because, by the way, in Florida, um, like East Coast people, like from New York and New Englanders, tend to populate a lot of the areas. But there's a little area in Florida called the Tampa Bay area, especially Bradenton, Florida, where for some reason all the Hoosiers like to go. That's where they go. That's where they move or that's where they, they vacation. And that's where I met him. And I, I wasn't something else. You're used to transplants in Florida, but you're, you know, the Midwesterners are, are harder to come by. And I noticed that uh, even just even just that little bit of honesty, uh, it, it, like somebody that would that would actually, give, you know, Joel, he really makes a habit of not lying. Like he just uh, like like I'm not saying that there's, you know, he's perfectly honest, but he's like the most honest person I've ever met in my life. And um, uh, so even even something like that, where you could say there's not a tangible consequence um, where, you know, like, for instance, having a, having a baby out of wedlock while you're single or something like that. You know, those are tangible consequences. Um, uh, even with lying, uh, these spiritual consequences that uh, that a lot of us, when we're spiritually dead, we, just, we don't even realize. But I realized that um, even leading up to getting saved, I started to realize what it costs you. And I, and I didn't really have the concept at the time that it was sin. But now I realize that that's, that's what it is. Um, so I don't think there is a way to sin without having these uh, natural built-in consequences, be it in your, you know, in your spirit and having this, this feeling of guilt that you may don't even, you know, maybe don't even notice it until you have something to compare it to um, wishing that you were, you know, unshackled by, by just the, the weight of, of having so many lies and so many deceitful things you've done without even thinking, without even thinking twice about it, you know, that's a weight that really, um, you know, wears on you and holds you down in ways you're not aware of. Um, so I think that there is, it's just inescapable. Uh, so yeah, definitely true. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, let me see. Crips, did you answer? Yeah. All right, so everybody answer, right? So let me let me go if everybody's results has already gone up. I liked uh, Sister Paula the point point you made about uh, uh, even if you're not aware of a consequence, there is a consequence. Uh, I think that's probably the case. Um, I answer that's certainly true. Um, and it's hard for me to say, like, certainly true, certainly false, because, because I, I'm, I'm uh, leery about making the, you know, being so absolute. Uh, because it was something maybe the case, you know, most of the time, but to say it's always the case is, uh, you know, I have to be pretty confident before I go that far with something. But uh, in this case, I think it's safe to say it's always true, but but a person may not realize the consequence, that the toll that it took on them. They might even realize something's a result of it, but they're not connecting the dots and don't realize that what happened was a result of something they, they did. Um, now, there is another concept, and it's, it's not... Uh, um, I used to call it the law of reaping and sowing um, until I did the study on Job, um, and then I had to re rephrase it to the principle of reaping and sowing because um, reaping and sowing means that you're, you're, you're getting what you deserve. You know, if you do something bad, you get bad consequence. If you do something good, you get a good result. Uh, but I mean, we know in our lives and we can think of people who have um, been kind of innocent victims of circumstances, something befell them and they didn't deserve it. And, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a saying, uh, uh, bad things happen to good people sometimes. Now, obviously, uh, no one is really good, as Jesus said, but I'm talking about good in a relative sense. And we, uh, we look at a person and say they're, rel- they're a pretty darn good person compared to most, and yet something horrible has happened, and they didn't do anything to cause it. So I don't think reaping and sowing is a law, but I think it's a principle that's generally true. And it's, it's safe to say that if you do the right things in your life, you're going to get good results back. If you're doing all the wrong things, you're going to have some consequences. You're going to reap what you sow, uh, generally. 
uh, and it, it, but with true, but with sin, I would say that it is absolute. Uh, but you might not realize, as I said, you might not connect the dots and realize that the consequence you're suffering is because of some sin. Um, uh, now there is a concept in the Bible and uh, in the, uh, the mosaic laws of the sacrifice system. They they had a sacrifice for what they called the unknown sin. Um, those these are sins that you don't even realize you you do, and, and you know we like to bring that up a lot of times. Uh, like when we're talking about First John one nine, and people want to use that as a as a, or people think that they've got to uh, you know confess uh, all their sins to get salvation, or they got to confess their sin to restore fellowship. But the point is, you don't even know all your sins. I mean, really, I mean, there's a lot of sins you don't, you're not even aware you're doing it. These are unknown sins. That's why they had a sacrifice to cover all the bases, just in case I didn't think of something some to, sac to put on the sacrifice. Uh, here's one for the unknown sins I didn't realize. Uh, we are unaware of a lot of our sins that we, we do. Uh, and I think that's because um, the most natural thing for a person to do is sin. And just think about it. Uh, if you anybody here have children as your children were growing did you teach them how to sin anybody here is that like i need to start teaching my child how to sin now uh, no th they start lying before you you ever have a chance to even explain what lies are and all of a sudden they're lying and now you have to teach them what a lie is uh yeah sin comes very naturally because we have a sin nature it's the most natural thing in the world for us to, to sin um uh, and and so there are consequences matter of fact there's saying that uh, uh sin always brings its own brings its own consequences in other words we don't have to um worry about god uh you know uh, uh bringing uh, some kind of chastisement on you because sin itself brings its own consequences along with it you can't es escape that um I don't know. I guess that's all I can think of. Um, but I said, it, in order to say an absolute, it's, it's, uh, I think we need to be leery of that. But I think in this case, I feel comfortable in saying, yeah, it, it always has some kind of consequence, even though you, you may not even be aware of it. All right, who wants to say more? All right. All right, then, do you want to tell us any uh, comments? Um, I've been looking at the chat room, and it seemed like it's lagging way behind. The chat room comments are related to things that we talked about 15 minutes ago, it looks like. So I'm uh, uh, really OK. Uh, well, it's working. It's just slow. And I think I know what's going on. Uh, and so I'll make corrections for the next time. Um, and I, so I, I think I know exactly what to fix it, but there's not a whole lot to do it now, about it now. We'll have a good recording uh, after the fact. Um, and again, they might be behind, but they should be getting yeah. something. I'm seeing um, a comment here. Let me respond to this real quick. Michael McGregor wrote, uh, I never usually get consequences, only feeling bad. Mike, don't you realize that that's your consequence? <laughs> that's yeah. the consequence. You feel bad, but it is a consequence in itself. All right. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. The first person says, uh, in, in response to this uh, statement, yes, death. Death is on caps. Uh, second one is the penalty for sin is death, so it's hard to think around that one. I agree. That it's pretty uh, pretty clear. Um, there is there is without question our bad choices affect others. Another person says all sin, even the smallest white lie, is at the very least straw that will be burned up at the bema seat. We suffer loss, hence consequence. That was Heather Bridgman. <laughs> Very well said. Mm -hmm. um, next one is someone says sin when it is conceived brings forth death. However, that parses out or however that parses out. Next person says, because God is just, I say yes. However, we may not ever see or understand the consequence. Another person says, I'm trying to think if this is appropriate or not. I, I just move on. Um, Sin can bring consequences to us, but not always. As it's written in the Bible, you reap what you sow. However, God's grace sometimes doesn't allow certain things to happen because he's gracious and is giving us a second chance. God doesn't deal with us 
as our new American Standard Bible, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. New King James Version, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us for our iniquities, which is Psalm 103.10. Is that it? Yep. All right. Okay. I guess we'll move on. Okay. That was, uh, again, that was a question for Aud from Autumn. Another great question. And she has another one. It is, it is true or false. Actions are more influential than words. I'll go first. <laughs> All right, brother. Go ahead. Yes. I, that's, I, I love that. I, I, I have, had this conversation with so many people like when you bring up to them that you know you, you feel like they're upset with you or they're angry with you or whatever and they and they'll they'll uh they'll say well I, I never said i was angry or i never said i'm mad at you but their actions uh speak louder than words that's also true about someone says oh i love you i really care about you but yet their actions are showing a completely different thing or at least making you feel like uh, it's a completely different thing. Um, it would have been easy for for God to say, well, you know, I want to send my only son to save you. Um, but no, uh, he said it and he did it. And uh, that gives us all eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. It's easy for anybody to say something, say, I love you, say, I care about you. I care what happens to you. Uh, or or make promises, but if they're not backed up by actions, they mean nothing to me. Um, somebody can say to me all they want, yeah, you, you know, I, I care about you, but if there's no actions to to back it up, um, I'm dubious. So certainly true. Okay, all right, thank you. How about Sister Lisa? Well, I think that's what James was talking about. Uh, when he said that I'll show you my faith by my works, that uh, he was basically saying, don't talk about it, be about it. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of people who will say uh, say a lot of things, but, you know, talk is cheap. Now, I think it also depends on what we're talking about as well, because words can be very hurtful. And... Uh, People have, as the Bible indicates, committed murder with their tongue. You know, so uh, words can be a very powerful thing as well. So I, I really think it does depend on what we're talking about. But, uh, yeah, I think that uh, we should demonstrate our faith by living it out because uh, the Bible says we are living epistles known and read of all men. And as we go about in life, there are people watching you that you aren't even aware that's watching you. Oh, yeah. And mostly, too, <laughs> uh, family. When you have impressed family because they know you, you might can come on here and fool people. <laughs> and you might be able to uh, fool even your coworkers and stuff. But your family knows you. And when they're impressed with the changes in your life. And the things that you made, not because you're trying to be religious, but just because you're actually living out your faith. And that that is demonstrated in the way that you deal with them. Not that you're perfect, but that you make the corrections that are needed that you probably didn't do before. Or if you took things for granted and then you stop. Or you were a little more coarse with your words and now you're not. Whatever it is, the the changes that they notice because of Christ, uh, that that is what will, if they're not born again, can lead them to faith in Christ because they see marked changes in you. So, yes, I would agree. But I think it does depend on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. How about Sister Angel? Yes, yeah, that's another thing that when I was lost, I would have argued 
oh no, that's not, I used to argue, oh, well, that's not always true. Sometimes words really, you know, like uh, it would be in, oh, basically to make excuses for uh, deadbeat boyfriends or something like that. I, <laughs> I used to argue <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, that, that, no, but, they, but well, you don't know what he said to me. You know, <laughs> and I know he meant it. Um, and that's, uh, and I think that that, <laughs> that's, uh, that's you know where people get in trouble and i think honestly yes uh, uh, obviously our actions always speak louder than words and um and sometimes sometimes that's that's how people that's almost the the the, the only way certain people really uh, express how they feel they have to show you because they don't really know how to verbalize their feelings uh, my my husband's that way um you know he i mean he's he's much more of a doer than a sayer and um uh, you know, that probably for the first time in my life, <laughs> that I've actually been with somebody like that. And I much prefer it. It took a lot of adjusting, you know, to get to that point where I didn't always feel like, oh, but you didn't compliment me enough or whatever. But he, he, um, he, he doesn't do much of that, but he's incredibly demonstrative uh, in, in the way, you know, nobody's ever, you know, shown me how much they care about me the way he does. And so um, that was a real good object lesson in in um, why people have always said that, why people have always said that, you know, even with my own father, um, my dad could be a bit terse. Um, he could be, you know, he wasn't very good at telling you good things, you know, praise and stuff like that. But if he did something bad, he would be quick to criticize. So, you know, my dad was always there. Yeah. Uh, so, and a lot of people can't say that about their fathers. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, I honestly, I think a lot of men are that way. And I think that uh, we've been trained in the society over especially the past century to have a very female way of looking at things, especially even male children are, are emasculated in the home, especially by a lot of people that, you know, they, they, they're, they're single mothers now. And, and, you know, whether it's their fault or not, they can't really raise um, men uh, you know, the way a father can. And um, so I think that the society's kind of shifted where, where we look at words as somehow tantamount to, uh, to action. But that's, I don't think that's how especially men are designed to demonstrate their feelings um, and, how, and what they care about and what they value. Um, and um, I think that uh, uh, women are nurturers, right? So women would be more in, uh, inclined to I mean, it's important, for, especially for a mother, to show her love and her feelings, you know, verbally, uh, as well as in everything that she does. But I mean, a big part of that, I mean, if you can think back to the warmest, most fuzzy moments with your mom, it was not chiefly, you know, in her action. It was also in, in how she was talking to you and the things she said and maybe the names that she would call you, her pet names and stuff. And so that's a female way, I think, of, of communicating love and affection. Um, and I think men that their chief way of doing that is, is through what they do for their families and for their loved ones. Um, and so I think they're, they're, they have an equal importance in a way in the sense that, you know, if you never tell somebody how you feel um, um, and like, for instance, if you were to just constantly demonstrate um, your good deeds, uh, at, you know, like as James was talking about, but you don't ever share the gospel. With, you don't ever share, you don't ever tell people, you don't have witness for Christ. I mean, it, it won't ever win them to Christ. They won't know that you're a Christian. That credit won't go to God. Um, so in a, in a weird way, it's kind of like they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're equal, especially if you think about it in terms of the gospel. Um, so I think it, I, it, it really does depend on what we're talking about. If we're talking about just in, in a carnal sense, I think we can all say most of the time actions are more heavily weighted. But when you think about in the sense that, you know, God's word, that's his word. You know, what are we talking about when we talk about words? Um, you know, um, uh, a lot of times it's our actions. Obviously, what God did for us, like like Jason pointed out, is what, what, what you know, validates his word in our eyes. His word is an account, a record of what he, he did. But... Um, but if you think about it in terms of evangelism, no amount of this is what Catholics do. They, they do a lot of uh, food drives and, you know, uh, charitable works and stuff. And uh, I mean, they never share the true gospel, let's be honest. But I mean, they don't they're very light on sharing really any gospel whatsoever. Um, 
Um, so I think that if, if you really, if you think about the, the weight of a Christian testimony, um, that's, that's important as well. Uh, so, hmm, I guess, uh, I guess I'll just say, uh, leaning true, but, uh, but kind of, kind of, kind of in the middle here, cause I haven't really thought about it in context of the gospel. And I think that's kind of important. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to say, so I'll make, uh, go next. It's. I put leaning true. Uh, I, I, I'm cl- very close to certainly true, uh, but I know that sometimes uh, I, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, when it says actions are more influential than words, sometimes your action are your words. You know, the words could be the actual action. Right is is uh needed uh being able to say something helpful could be an action uh and in that case the words uh are are the action so it's actions generally are more influential um there's a saying um well done is better than well said um of course in james someone someone mentioned that uh, he says be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves uh, so i i would say that, yeah it's probably better to uh, you know, show me uh, do something uh, rather than just talk but sometimes talking is the most helpful thing that you can do uh, who hasn't answered this yet um, i haven't answered yet All right go ahead um well you know, I had an answer in the beginning, but then listen to not, listening to all you guys, it really made the statement a lot more complicated. Um, like when Jason was talking, he took my initial answer. So I was like, yes, absolutely. You know, they say that 90% of communication is nonverbal and you can say whatever you want to say. I mean, people do it all the time. Um hypocrites, right? People who say one thing and do another. And then, but then when Lisa was talking, I was thinking, yeah, words are extraordinarily powerful. Like they're like, you know, I remember something my husband said to me 10 years ago. And when I'm in bitter town, (laughs) this, this memory pops up. And it's just as painful as it was back then to to hear myself replay it. And it's like, I'm not considering the last 10 years he's been so good to me, you know, and he, and he has another a statement that I said around about the same time that cut him so deeply that sometimes I think the devil will bring it up to his mind when we're upset with each other or something. So they, words are extraordinarily powerful. Now the question is, or the statement is, Actions are more influential than words. So influential, what does that mean? The ability to influence. So I think of like when Angel was talking, I thought of my granny because she was a Christian. She behaved as a Christian, but she never really talked to me about God. She never told me what God said, what was right, what was wrong. So, but now when I think about her, all those actions, I see why she was doing them and now it's influencing me. So yeah, I think Angel kind of hit on it. It really, and, and Lisa, I think it really just depends on what exactly we're talking about because also I'm influenced by the words of God. I'm influenced by his actions as well coming here living life as a man, dying, um, being resurrected. His actions are certainly influential, but on a day-to-day basis, it's his words. Those words are so powerful. So yeah, um, my, my vote was certainly true, but I think I might change it to give me more information. (laughs) It depends on really what you're talking about. And maybe it is that like you, Luke, you kind of alluded to it a little bit like that your words and your action sh- should be the same. I mean, 
I would think that that would be like a state of perfection or something. If you can say wise words and behave in a wise way, that they both be influential. But yeah, um, this was great to listen to all you guys because you really got me thinking about several different scenarios of whether that could be true or false, depending on exactly what, what we're talking about. Hmm. So that's my strange yeah. convoluted answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, is it, uh, is it safe for me to uh, conclude that uh, you are still learning? Uh, yeah, I won't stop learning until I'm dead. No, actually I take that back. Cause I'll, I'll be forever learning. Won't we all? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward I mean, to it in eternity. The most, yeah. the most pleasurable thing in my life now, isn't it? You might, some people might say, well, that's sad. But the most pleasurable thing in my life is learning. Uh, I, I, I Nobody just, would say that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know people that would hear me say that and say, oh, that's really sad. <laughs> it's always been my favorite thing, really. It's always been my favorite thing to do. Why am I the only one that says the most pleasurable thing in my life is cheesecake? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just oh, kidding. cheesecake's really good too. Good point. Good point. Yes. Okay. Um, let me uh, respond to something here in the chat room, and maybe others would like to respond too. But uh, let me see. I highlighted it, so I hope it's still there. It is. Animal Lover two four zero zero wrote a question: Is believing Lordship salvation? after already being saved, sin? Uh, my, my answer, animal lover, is... Um, um, the mere it, thought of foolishness is sin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But uh, I, I would say that if, if, you, if somebody, I'm not, I don't know if you're thinking of yourself or somebody else, but uh, if somebody... Uh, believes in lordship salvation they are not believing the gospel they're not a believer if they believe lordship salvation that's not the gospel now then that begs the question is okay i said your question is if they've already been saved in the past and now they believe in lordship so this is the concept of a, a believer going into apostasy now we debate this some some people believe that that's impossible um, um most of us i think it it does happen and um, matter of fact the interesting thing is that um on the wednesday study this just two nights ago we we're on uh, galatians chapter four and we did the first half of it and it was really quite profound uh that uh, uh i think there it's inescapable to come to the conclusion they cannot come to any other conclusion that that this group of people paul's talking to in galatia are real believers and now they're apostate they believe that judaism is necessary also and judaism could be replaced with lordship salvation it's both a works system uh, so uh, I, i'm one that believes yes uh, real believers sometimes go into apostasy uh and is it sin I, yeah you're no longer you don't believe the gospel uh, so it is sin but uh then the important thing is uh, some of these people, though, who believe in lordship, they never did get saved in the past. Uh, that's something we cannot determine. If you're one of those who got saved and now you're apostate, or are you someone who never really got saved in the first place? We can't know that. Um, but the only thing we can determine is what do you believe now? And if your per person believes lordship salvation now, I'm, I, I hate to break it to you. I hate to be cruel, but that person's not a believer. All right. Uh, anybody else want to? Respond to uh, animal lover. That was a really good answer. I, I don't think I can add anything to that, but I would just say that I completely agree with the way that you uh, phrased all that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say yes, absolutely. And I think he just summed up perfectly why it doesn't need to be an issue too much of, to divide over in the sense that uh, we can only do one thing about it, no matter what it is. We can only, we can only uh, clarify the gospel for those people. Also, too, is that uh, Paul says anything not done in faith is sin, and lordship, really by definition, is a lack of faith. It's it's what doing. It's uh, trying to be justified by works, um, not by faith. Um, 
with regards to this question, I didn't answer. I'll answer it real quick. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, oh, so if it is it more influential? I think it depends on um, uh, which which one of those are you less hi hypocritical with. Um, uh, like for example, we as believers, we uh, we we are more influenced by God's words. <laughs> Don't take this wrong. Uh, we are more. It's, it's uh, I want to say, maybe I think this through, but we're more influenced by God's words because we haven't seen his actions like on, on the cross, for example. We believe it through the influence of his words, but we actually haven't seen it. I don't know if that makes any sense. I just I had that thought. Um, it's probably nothing, but. Um, no, no, it makes no sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the one you're less righteous with uh, is, is what uh, also is probably what determines what, what's more influential. You know, I, I know that, um, I think it was a Pope that said at one point, uh, that I, I think he said a foolish thing. Um, and that is where he said, uh, preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. I mean, I think that was an absurd thing to say. Um, and uh, again, that to me, that's a, that's a form of hip of, of hypocrisy. Um, wow. and even the social gospel, um, or I, I don't know they call it social gospel, friendship, fellowship, or, or friendship gospel or evangelism. I, I generally uh, uh, agree that's a good approach. But if 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 by saying social uh, gospel or uh, friendship uh, evangelism, they mean, oh, I want this person to see how great and how calm I can handle situations and how happy I am and how much joy. And then ask me about my joy and my, uh, you know, my uh cute you know cool cucumber uh attitude um i think that's that's hypocr hypocr hypocritical as well because um yes you should uh you know you know walk the walk and you know uh, or walk the talk or whatever but uh ultimately the people need to hear the gospel and you're, they're not going to know the gospel by looking your at your actions um but and also too is that there's a lot of things that I, one of the greatest regrets i have um as a person as when my kids are really little, I used to promise them, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. I'm going to do this for you. We're going to do this. And, and I fully intended to do these things, um, but I never got around to it or life got in the way. And I had to I had to break my promises. And that that uh, really bothers me to this day. Uh, and it's, wow. it is. Wow. Yep. That wounded me as a kid just with family members doing that. It really messed me up, actually. Yeah. Yes. And I worry about that with my kids, too. Yes. Uh, I do. Yeah. And so I, I, again, I had every intention of doing these things. Um, but I didn't really think about, you know, the, the practical, the practicality of if I could really do it and fit it into my schedule and things like that. And even today, this, that's probably my greatest weakness is I'm overly optimistic. Uh, even with, when I'm when, with my job, I have to interface with customers. I'm very optimistic. I, I, it, I always think, okay, because I can do it and I'm one of the few people that can do it. I better, I, I'm going to do it. But at the same time, I, a lot of times I, I just can't. I'm just one person and I can't do it. And I think I, I probably disappointed a lot of people, even in this church, that I promised things that I, I couldn't uh, fulfill properly. Or um, So, I, you know, again, it's, it is definitely a weakness of mine and I'm uh, trying to get better at it. But um, so, yes, I think it all, but hopefully it comes down to um, which one are you less hypocritical hypocr with? Because that's going to determine which one's more influential. People see, uh, you know, even small children can see hypocrisy. Hello? Yeah, I'm still, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I guess I I'll, agree. I has, everybody, go has everybody answered this question? I think so. All yeah. right. Yeah, how about any any comments? Oh, I didn't. Doesn't look like we got very many answers on the poll. I'm only seeing six answers, but it could be lagging behind. I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I again apologize about that. Um, make I'll make changes so that it doesn't happen. Um, I think the playback will be decent, but um, okay. So the 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 first comment was I think both go hand in hand, Laura Stubbs, and I. I that's what I was kind of trying to get at. I guess in in, in fewer words. Um, Anonymous, another person says the word was God and the word was God. Creation, however, was an action through the word. Hmm. <laughs> that's an interesting thought. And that's kind of, I was kind of trying to touch on that as well, where, um, 
again, we're more influenced by God's words than his actions, but we believe I, I, they go hand in hand. So I guess, I, yeah, I guess that's what it was. The worst does by give the best answer. I think <laughs> they go hand in hand. I, 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 uh, I don't agree with that. I, uh, God has said words. There, there are prophecies that were written a long, long time ago that we know have, have been enacted, have been acted upon. So it's for me, yes, I believe the words of God. And yes, there are still some things that have yet to happen, but I believe them because of actions that have already taken are already taken place. It's not just on words. I mean, I, I think it'd be very difficult just to just to believe uh, someone's words without any actions whatsoever. And yes, yeah, I didn't witness the crucifixion, but people witnessed it, and I believe their witness. The disciples, the disciples and apostles, uh, they were there. And in looking at all the context of Scripture and seeing all the other prophecies that were uh, written many, many years ago, and then did come true, and we have uh, some kind of evidence that they've come true. Then, hearing what the apostles said uh, and the people that did witness the uh, crucifixion, that's that's part of why people are saved. They believe. Uh, the the words of God, yes, but they also believe, the, at least for me, I believe some of the evidences uh, th that have come over time. Yeah, that, that was me talking out loud, and I, I totally agree with you. Um, just thinking out loud and probably should have kept it to myself. So, yeah. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus is the living word as well. He is the Logos and the Rhema. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he told us in his word Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God. If the Lord makes a pronouncement, that's a prophecy you can take to the bank because mm -hmm. it's going to come to pass. Whether you think so or not, whether you think it's even in the realm of possibility. Right. I mean, Abraham and Sarah will be a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to say. Basically, when I said, well, whatever one you're less hip hip hypocritical with, if you're if you're righteous, your actions are as influential as your works. Um, to me, you know, if God says He's going to do something based on things actions He's previously done, uh, yes, he, you know, they're they're as infl they're the same. They they are equal, and they go hand in hand in that respect. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when I first heard the question, uh, I didn't even think of it in that uh, sense uh, that uh, uh, the uh, the word of God compared to the actions of God. I was thinking uh, our, what we say compared to what we do. Uh, so um, in that sense, uh, can we all agree that um, it would be uh, the ideal is for our actions to match our words? Yeah. But how about if it doesn't? If we say one thing and do another, there's a name for that. Hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is one of the... Um, stumbling blocks for uh, non-believers, they see the hypocrisy in professing believers, yeah. and they don't want to have anything to do with it. I've had people say Christians are such hypocrites, I would never, could never be part of it. And yeah. I just say, well, yeah, we're all hypocrites. Every person has some hypocrisy, uh, but and some is, but is very obvious, but Jesus is not a hypocrite. That's right. the question. Uh, you just, you're, it's all about Jesus, not about you and me or us. Um, all right. Is there uh, any more on this one? Mm -hmm. All right. I think we got time for one more. Maybe if we make it quick. Okay. As long as uh, it's not a complicated one, Ben. Well, mm -hmm. that's what we have here and what I have already queued up. Um, okay. Uh, this is one here. Um, not an easy one. Uh, true or false, God is speaking to some people today and giving new revelation meant to be heard by all. Hmm. Nice. Hmm. Very interesting. Nice. Okay. All right, Crips, you sound like you're raring to go. Go ahead. Yeah, that was my question, and I, and I had Crips in mind when I posed it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, the The Bible is what we have to go by. Um, and just because someone says God told them this or God told them that, if they're framing it in, in terms of everyone needs to know this, rather than someone saying, you know, God told me this, a certain situation, uh, 
yes, God does talk to us, but as far as something that everyone else needs to hear, um, frankly, I'm tired of hearing people saying, you know, God's got a word, and you've heard me talk about this, God's got a word, uh, prophetic word for the month, every month, and it's not just one person, it's several people that do it. And I don't, I don't believe a word they say. And it's hard for me to believe the other things that they say uh, as well, based on that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically like uh, Cleo and the psychic network uh, given a Christian label, uh, in my opinion. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating how many people say that, say that uh, God's got uh, something that he told them that is not backed up by scripture and that they need to share that with everyone and everyone needs to take it seriously. Um, and I, I take anything that anyone says to me seriously. And if I have a question about it, I go to scripture uh, and, and also pray about it. And God will reveal to me, I believe whether it's true or not true. Uh, but, but I, yeah. All right. Y'all done. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Uh, kind of an abrupt stop. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to think of how how to answer. God is speaking to some people today. and Oh, so certainly false. That's why it was an abrupt stop. I was like, now, how do I answer? It's certainly true. It's certainly, certainly false. Yeah. You, uh, when you stop that quickly, put your arm out so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're getting funnier, Brother Luke. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, brother. Um, I'm Some both. of us would say, "Don't encourage, brother Luke." Brother Luke. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny too. Yeah, that was very, two good. In a row. very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, it just take me a second on this one. It's um, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about if that. I can remember what it was now, what was the question? <laughs> I forgot. It, can, uh, people making these prophecies today and saying oh, that it's you know of yeah, the Lord. All right. thank you thank you yeah. so the, the the word of god is is uh, completed and um i'm not going to uh believe anything that's written or anything that's stated no matter who it is no matter if they're a renowned authority or even if it's one of you on the panel any person who tells me, thus saith the Lord, if they're expressing it yes. in that way, uh, I am going to be uh, alarmed and disturbed and, and a lot of concern and doubt. Um, there, are, there are things that I have a lot of confidence, uh, uh, and I believe that uh, God has revealed some things to me, and I believe that the mm -hmm. brethren and sistren has revealed things, and I've learned a lot, and I have a lot of confidence. But uh, I'm going to really restrain myself from, from saying that the Lord spoke to me and, and, and gave me this information. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I hear quite a few people doing that and speaking with that kind of, uh, making it that kind of authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and when you do that, you're making it basically the word of God. God spoke to you. And I, I had a Bible study at my house one time and a new person came. I didn't know him. And, but they started talking about this thing and how all these things that God spoke to them and they're, they're revealing all this stuff to us and, and declaring it as, as uh, you know, it's, it's absolute truth. And, and that's uh, the word of God. And, and, uh, and, and I also had a close friend here on, used to be in the pan, one of my panels for a while too, that, and he was doing things like that. And I, I said, look, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I think that we, we, uh, we have to not, uh, I can't put any confidence in you saying that the Lord revealed it to you, the Lord spoke to you, and now I'm supposed to just accept that? What if you say the Lord told you A, and someone else at the same time says, well, the Lord told me the contrary? And they, these things happen. People are saying that, they, that you know, that they got a revelation from God, and they're, they're contradictory revelations. Uh, so I'll stick with the scriptures. And I caution everybody about, uh, you know, making uh, claims like that. So before you you state something uh, that in that way, uh, I would say you're you're treading on very dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. All right, who wants to go next? Uh, I guess I will real quick. I don't have much to say. Uh, I totally agree with you, Crips, um, and I feel the same way. Uh, and there's just so many of those people out there that it, it's not just big name 
celebrities either. It's just it's like, for example, I worked with a guy one time. Uh, it was a customer of mine, and we he was we were talking about uh, the Bible and whatnot, and he showed to me the, the books he had written. He wrote like I don't know ten books, and I'm looking at the cover of one of them right now. It says it's called the fifty two. It's called fifty two pickup, and on the on the cover it's got a, a 1952 pickup that apparently he restored. And part of that restoration, he learned deep spiritual lessons. And the quote he has on the on the uh, the tagline of the book is, "These are the words I give to you to share with everyone." Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, that kind of thing just really, really upset me. And um, I, I, I hope he's, I hope he's ready for the judgment that he's going to face on that. Um, you yeah, know, I'd like to comment on that when, it, when it comes back around, because I have, uh, I have a lot to say about that, about the judgment part. Right. No, and you, if, you if, if he's a believer, if he's a believer, it, it's not a, a, it's not a salvation issue, uh, but. Um, if he, I don't know, he's probably an unbeliever is what I'm guessing, just the, based on what I can see, his actions. <laughs> um, so uh, but that, I find that very disturbing and, and really disgusting. So, yeah. All right. All right. Sister Lisa, you have something to say? Yeah. Uh, this, was, this is kind of weird. Now, if you're talking about people talking about the word and coming out like this is a thus saith the Lord and it's some new revelation – like they're actually writing a new book. <laughs> Absolutely not. So that's right. a bunch of bonk. Now, there is what's called a word of prophecy where a person is led by the Lord to say something to you that will be a confirmation <laughs> or it can be a word of knowledge about a particular situation. Maybe you were looking for insight on, but it's not going to be something that's coming out of left field. Right. Now there's rare there's rare there's rare circumstances where there might be an exception. And I do have one I'm gonna share with you. I remember I had been ministering to a guy at work, uh, you know, preaching the gospel to him, and he was on the fence and he couldn't make up his mind because he was a Roman Catholic and he had been a Roman Catholic. He's like in his seventies. So he'd been a Catholic all his life. Everybody in his family was Catholic, he's Catholic. So, you know, I understood. I had family that's still doing that stuff, you know, distant family. And I was I was mentioning the gospel to him. And as I'm as I'm talking to him, the Lord says, he says to me, he says, tell him because his wife had just passed away. And he says, tell him she's with me. Now, I want you all to know I'm not <laughs> I'm not a prophet. I don't go around doing this stuff. And I was like, oh, God, no. I said, Lord, Lord, that's literally like this. Lord, are you sure? <laughs> Because I'm sweating. I'm like, see, because I know that you don't just step out and say stuff like this and not be 100. And it was such a strong unction. It was like he it was like a, a, a firm again. He said, tell him she's with me. I said, um, brother, I believe the Lord is telling me to tell you that your wife is with him in heaven. And he looked at me funny. He was like, yeah, I said. I don't go around just saying stuff like that. And I didn't want to say it to you, but the Lord told me to tell you. So he said, oh, OK. And he went home. And now I, I want you to know. So I'm going to show you an example of this. That's why I don't trust people to just do this stuff, because I sweated for like two months behind that. Yeah. I tossed and turned. I was like, Lord, I was going over it with was that really you? I'm sure I know it was you because I was thinking something else. I'm preaching the gospel. So long story short, I see him again at work and he's got the smile on his face. He said, I'm saved. And I'm like, well, praise the Lord, brother. What happened? And she ministered salvation to me. And I said, that's awesome. Praise God. He said, oh, and I wanted to tell you, you were right about my wife. And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, my granddaughter led her to the Lord two months before she passed away. And she, uh, her and my granddaughter had been praying for me wow. for the whole time. Wonderful. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lord, for letting me off the hook. <laughs> because I spoke that in obedience to, to him and to the Holy Spirit. And I didn't even want to say it. But this is what I'm saying about, the, this is what the Bible says, how he will confirm his word with signs following. I had no idea that I was ever even going to see him again, let alone have him come back and give me that as his report. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying about there are rare situations 
but there should be some evidence like that. And and, and like I said, I don't run around there. And let me tell you, the late, you know, the last time I said God told me something was that time. That's been more than 10 years ago. It's not, not something I run around doing. Now, that being said, all this stuff about people coming out like they got a brand new word and a brand new revelation. No, mm-hmm. that's why I just put up that verse in Second Peter 120 about that no prophecy is of a private interpretation. Yeah. You have to be careful with these people. I, it, you know, and there, there's people going around trying to teach pro- prophetic classes on how how to be prophetic. And I'm going, I how yep. do you teach a class on how to be prophetic? Yeah. You you either have that gift from the Lord or you don't. Right. Right. So I- I- anyway, so uh, let's go back to the true or false. Is God speaking to some people today, giving new revelation meant to be heard by all? <laughs> uh, I'm going to say no. Not new revelation meant to be heard by all. Not the way they're doing it. It'll already be scripture. They may have a word where they, they can show you something you didn't see in the scripture before, but it's always been there. That's a different thing. Amen. Right. It, Amen. Yeah, I, at least I, um, I totally believe your story, and I, I totally believe that's possible and happening. That's why I worded the question the way it did. It says, new revelation meant to be heard by all. And mm-hmm. again, like this guy I was talking to about, he wrote this book, and he, like, he sold like eight copies like to his family members. You know, It's like, okay, you got new revelation. And God saw that eight people got it in their hands, you know, <laughs> it's like. Yeah, uh, you, you worded the question uh, great, Ben, yeah, in my opinion. It's, it, it makes right. it pretty easy to answer. How about uh, Sister Paula? Um, uh, okay. Uh, God is speaking to some people today and giving new revelation meant to be heard by all. Um, I, I voted undecided. And because, uh, so I think like when Jason was talking, I remembered this guy who came up to me and said, oh, the Lord told me to tell you that he knows you're struggling with something and he's there for you or something really vague like that. I was like, oh, all right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> like, I, I know that because I can get it from his word and we live in a sinful world. So <laughs> like, but thank you. Um, But what also came to mind is like, you know, 200 years ago when people would be reading the Bible, maybe they'd think like, um, you know, this guy who's going to claim to be God in Revelation, the son of perdition, you know, how's he going to know if everybody's worshiping him or not? And now today we're like, oh, well, we can tell, we can see now, you know, there's all these sort of tracking and tracing methodologies that they're using now it's crystal clear how he could possibly do something like that and i once heard um i don't really remember the bro the the show i was watching but the guy was a soul winner and he was he was saying you know he's an old guy and he was saying like that maybe he had heard this from someone else but when they first came out with the television they like suddenly when he read go into all the world and preach the gospel all of a sudden he he saw like a way that that could be done with television so new revelation meant to be heard by all maybe it's not new maybe it's um more clarifying information to the already spoken revelation that god has given meant to be heard by all but um, these ones that are so popular now that are saying things that aren't in scripture and that sometimes go against scripture. I mean, come on. That's that's why we have scripture. That's what we go to to see if these things are so. I mean, that's what we stand on. So those, you know, uh, of course, they're they're charlatans. They're whatever you want to call them but they're not um, speaking from the Lord. But what Lisa was saying, I I absolutely do think that the Lord works through people like that. But like Ben was saying, his question specifically says to be heard by all, you know, that guy needed to hear what the Lord had Lisa tell him, but not everybody needed to hear that. Um, But when I think about maybe more clarification about what God 
says is coming, I could see someone saying, you know, pointing to a particular operation, like saying, okay, maybe this is how it's going to be done. Now we can see more clearly how what he's already said can actually take place. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, my, my answer was undecided for those reasons. Okay. Thank you. Sister Angel. Um, uh, leaning, leaning false. Um, I think, uh, uh, the by all is the really important keyword here for me. Um, yeah. and currently, I don't know, I don't know of any, uh, anything currently, any situation that I could, I could think currently would be consistent biblically with, uh, with new revelation meant to be heard by all. But I, I do think that like what Apollo said, new clarification, um, the, the test is that we shall always be able to confirm these things in God's word. Yes. Um, you know, so, so, uh, so, and it won't, you know, even, even new revelation, no matter at what time, it's not going to contradict God's word anyway. Yes. Um, so, so, so that's, so that's, I think that's the, uh, the difference in the past, these, these revelations were not yet revealed. They weren't in the script. There was no, you weren't going to be able to go confirm them with scripture. So um, uh, now, uh, you know, because they were scripture, <laughs> they, they were what became scripture. Um, but, um, but now we have, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the word revealed um, in full. And we have a lot of people that have a very hard time actually understanding it. And so, I believe God reveals to each of us when we're, you know, when we're really um, uh, doing his work and, and trying to reach people, especially individually, he'll reveal to us what that person's not understanding, what that person needs to hear to really, um, to really make something click, you know, to help, to help, uh, to, you know, if we can help in their, in their, um, you know, their journey toward faith in him. Um, he can use us to, uh, to, 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 you know, to clarify certain things, to get over certain mental blocks that they may have that, you know, that are keeping them hardened to, uh, to, to scripture in some way. Um, and like with Sister Lisa, you know, I, I believe that uh, uh, absolutely that happened. I have a, a weird situation that, you know, uh, I have, I, I'm pretty sure that it was the Lord. And it, I, I can only imagine he was trying to, to, this is when I first got saved, trying to teach me how to tell the difference between his voice and my imagination, because um, I and this is this is like one of the only instances this has ever happened that was so stark for me um, that uh, a few months before Chris Cornell of Soundgarden, uh, quote unquote, killed himself uh, in an impossible suicide. Um, I suddenly out of nowhere began to, to, to realize he was going to be killed. He was going to be murdered one day. And um, this was right after I got saved when like a whole lot of things were being shown to me. And uh, there was no reason <laughs> for me. I mean, he, nobody had really even talked about Chris Cornell in a long time at that point. You know, he's not a big uh, headline maker. Um, but um, I realized that I was listening to his music and God started showing me stuff and showing me things about his life and, what he was talking about in his songs and I began to realize he was life was in danger um, because the circles he runs in and his, uh, what, what God appeared to be showing me was his conscientious objection to the things that are done in Hollywood. And so um, I, I, I was worried about him actually. And he died a few months later in an impossible suicide and everybody was shocked. And I was shocked. I couldn't believe it because I, I couldn't, I didn't think it was going to be imminent. And I really believe, I, I don't believe that was an evil spirit doing that. Cause I mean, no, there's no real reason. This was, this was something that strengthened my communication with God in terms of like understanding when God is showing me something as opposed to me second guessing and thinking, Oh, that's my imagination. I'm in my head. You know, how am I really going to tell, you know, whether God said that or if it was, you know, just something I thought up this really helped me. And I think it was just a clear way he could use to show me the difference. Um, obviously I, I, he didn't really compel me to tell the whole world about it though. You know, in terms of like warning, Chris Cornell is going to be dead, you know, but I did tell a lot of people I knew, but it wasn't, you know, revelation that everybody needed to hear, you know, but it was something useful in terms of uh, me as a new believer 
learning how to, to and it also really made me understand like the Holy Spirit is, <laughs> is a real thing because um, uh, I, you know, I, have, I don't walk around saying I have premonitions and I have visions and all that stuff. I'm not that kind of person. So um, this was something very new to me. And it was just something that God used, I believe, you know, he, he'll, it's kind of a sign and wonder, you know, a little personal one um, uh, for me to just realize, you know, that like, just in case maybe I ever started to question, was this whole thing, my imagination, you know, is this, you know, new in faith and everything is this, is this whole being saved thing and being born again, is this real? Did I dream it up? Whatever. This was one of the ways that he anchored it into reality for me. Um, so that was revelation, but that was personal, really. Um, and I think that uh, with what Lisa said, that you know, that's a that's a personal basis, but it's not a it wasn't a legalistic thing where like now people are going to be judged based on their you know their adherence to this revelation or or whether you know what I mean, like with, with the gospel, for instance. So um, so yeah, uh, I I think you know um, mostly false. I believe that's how the question was phrased. All right. Okay, everybody's had a turn, I think. Uh, except Ben, right? Didn't you submit the question, Ben? Uh, yeah, I went. Uh, all right. Well, I wanted to say more, but you need to give your answer uh, first. No, no, I did. I did go. Well, you did. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let me say that um, uh, I had an experience at a small local church years ago where uh, there was this woman who would do this quite often, stand up and say a word of knowledge and uh, proclaim something, that she had a message from the Lord for this particular person or that particular person. Uh, and Now, if Sister Lisa did that, I would not be concerned at all. I'd want to hear it. Uh, but I think that there are people who um, can take something like that, and I'm quite skeptical because some people do it in the way that Jesus said, uh, well, some people are going to want to pray out in public, not without the right motivation, but only to get attention for themselves so that people think, oh, what a righteous person they are. And I believe that some people will use this kind of a thing sometimes uh, and just to make it, to elevate themselves that they were special in some way. So I am generally skeptical, uh, but uh, I would not question it if Lisa or anybody here uh, said something like that to me. Uh, you can probably remember, uh, I think it was on a Friday night recently, I talked about the, um, the time that I asked the Lord to open up the sky in Las Vegas, like the Red Sea, and stop the rain while we're preaching as a sign so I could tell people in advance, this is what I asked the Lord to do. And he, look, look at it. He did it. I, I Does anybody here believe me? I hope you do. But uh, uh, just as just as I would, I know, I know these things happen. I've experienced miracles myself. And, and uh, if, if I know Lisa and I know that her integrity, I would not have any doubts, but generally I, I'd say I would be skeptical. Sister Lisa? Yeah, no, I, I'm okay with that. I, I was skeptical. <laughs> when the Lord said it to me, I was like, uh, Lord, I really don't want to say that. And uh, I literally am standing there talking to him, wrestling with what the Lord's telling me to say. Because I know I'm not a prophet. And so I said, so look, that's why I, I phrased it the way I did. I believe he's telling me <laughs> to tell you. Because I didn't. I don't step out there going, thus saith the Lord. Uh-uh. <laughs> See, they, these people are too lightweight with that. And I'm yeah. like, I don't understand that. I'm yeah. telling you, see, because I've, listen, I experienced the Lord telling me something to tell somebody else. And I told you, it's a rare thing. It's been more than 10 years since he ever did it again. And I'm like, with the exception of what he places on my heart to speak, 
about concerning certain things. Um, actually, I think Thursday night, there was somebody that was in Sister Renee's audience that was listening. And the Lord gave me a word to say to, to them, but it was a generalization. I had no idea who it was for. I, I, I couldn't see into their life or none of that stuff. It was just a word concerning something they were struggling with. But the Lord was giving them a warning that they needed to stop doing whatever it was they were doing. And uh, I shared that. But with the with the exception of something like that, to, to say to somebody, the Lord is telling me, uh-uh, these people are too lightweight with that. And this is the reason I don't trust it. Um, and then the other is that most of the time when they say some of this stuff, okay, like certain prophets, I'm not going to name anybody. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. But they have said stuff and it didn't come true. Right. And according to the Bible, that's the mark of a false prophet. Right. But brother Luke, when you say that you pray and that the Lord held the uh, the rain for you, uh, I believe it. There's times that uh, I have prayed and asked the Lord for relief for for rain for like some of these fires and stuff that's going on, and it's happened. Not because I'm wonderful, because He's wonderful, and I'm sure there were probably thousands of other people, if not millions, praying the same thing. So you know, I'm not gonna say it was prophetic. Aesthetic because I did it, but there's people that do that weird stuff and they come on here and do that stuff. And I, I'm telling you, I cringe for them because yes. that ain't nothing to play with. Nope. That was gonna. If everyone's done, that's exactly what I was gonna say. And Ben mentioned it, and I didn't want to uh, prevent everyone else from uh, answering the question, but I just wanted to say really quickly, it's as if they have no fear of God. I, I, when you talk like that and, and pretend like you're a prophet uh, and, and say all these things, you're, you've got blood on your hands, in my opinion, because there are people that believe these folks. I think, Sister Lisa, you were talking about the, they teach in classes. I know, I, I know some people by name that are doing that, going around at speaking engagements and showing people how, how to give others a prophetic word for the month. It, and, and when I see that, I'm like, are, have they no fear of God? Have they no reverence for who God is? Um, and Sister Lisa, I just, uh, uh, I just want to say that you, you telling your story about what you did 10 years ago, that's exactly why I wouldn't question you. Because even in you telling the story, you're like, you, you struggled with it. You didn't just flippantly come out and, and, and do something that you felt like God was telling you. You, you struggled with it. You have that right attitude. You have a uh, you have a reverence for God. These people don't have a reverence, and it's a tell. You can see it that they don't, and uh, they're going to have to answer for that. They don't have to answer to me, um, but I, I I just fear for them as well. I, I'm I'm paraphrasing what you said, Sister Lisa and Brother Luke. What your story that you've told, I completely believe you. I hope everyone understands. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about God doesn't answer your prayers and do miraculous things. That's not at all what the, what the question is about. It's what, whether there are, are individual people that have private interpretation that God tells them, speaks to them that uh, all people should know. I mean, what God tells you to tell one single person. I mean, that's, that's between you and God, honestly. And I have no problem believing that, especially with, with people that I know on the panel and, and things like that. If you, if you told me you had a word for me from God, that'd be different to me. I would have to consider it. I would use scripture to to uh, to look at it, and I would talk to Father about it, and and we would go from there. All right, Amen. Okay, uh, I guess we've gone a little later than usual. Let so me, let me read the comments real quick. There, just a couple. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so someone says the Word of God has all the revelation. Watchmen on the wall keep telling it on the mountain another person says leaning true but i think new revelation would, would be only would only be valid if it's searching the scriptures and making connections to or receiving understanding about current events and then heather bridgman says the bible says that in the last days the holy spirit would be poured out on all flesh so i do believe that god speaks to us still new revelation though would have to be discerned as to if it lines up with the Bible. Yeah. Well, let's let's remember that uh, the uh, the uh, Joseph Smith claimed that uh, he got a new revelation from 
Moroni. <laughs> I always crack Moroni. up. I always correct. Uh, I can't believe that he would name that angel Moron. Uh, yeah. It's it's like a. Man, it must have been he must be laughing under his. Breath. I think the angel sure. named the. I think the angel named himself that. I think that I think an angel did deceive him, and I think it it punked him by saying, "Oh, my name's Moron Eye." <laughs> yeah. That's what I think. I don't. Well, was was there a, a, a demonic angel to deceive him, and or, or was he just making the whole thing up? Uh, either way, the fact that it's called Moron, I mean, come on, Mormons, you know what? You mm -hmm. The angel named Moron. Uh, I mean, it's like a to me, some of the inside joke, and they're laughing under their breath, thinking you're going to believe such stuff. But uh, then we got um, Muhammad. He claimed that Gabriel gave him a new revelation, and uh, we got the Quran. So the Book of Mormon, the Quran, are these new revelations, uh, and uh, um, so that's what that's what happens when you think that, that uh you know god's still going to continue revealing more after we have the bible that's when you don't listen to paul about his warning about another gospel from even from an angel from heaven yeah, exactly i mean what could it be any more clearly stated than the way paul wrote it about even if an angel comes with a different gospel that is twice <laughs> exactly what they said paul, uh joseph smith uh, matter of fact there's a there's a YouTuber, I uh, can't remember, Chris Putnam. Chris Putnam was excellent. Um, but uh, um, he, he has a channel, uh, an old channel. Uh, he has several channels, I think, now. But one's called Big Whammy Rocks. He's got some great uh, videos on refuting evolution. But uh, he, he made a video called Mo and Joe. <laughs> it was hilarious showing the Muhammad and Joseph Smith how similar they were. Um, okay, if there's, um, um, I guess it's time now for us to start uh, giving our closing remarks here. Um, looks like, I think we had a really good uh, participation in the chat room. Uh, we were able to uh, interact and respond with a lot of your questions and comments, so I'm happy about that. Let's start with Brother Cripps. Could you give us your summary remarks? Yeah, it was a, another fun fellowship Friday as usual. Uh, as I've said, I get a, get excited about Friday coming there every week, and that hasn't changed. It's still still exciting and still fun, and um, I, I enjoy everyone's answers and a uh, couple couple things uh, not necessarily agree with, but you know that happens, and that's the beauty of. Um, the whole setup in this particular church is that we can agree, uh, disagree on some things that are non-essentials and it doesn't, doesn't change anything. At least for me, it doesn't. Um, and I, uh, to me, that's a freedom uh, and it's a wonderful freedom that uh, is not afforded a lot of other churches out there. You just don't have the freedom to disagree, especially with uh, uh, pastors or uh, uh, people in, in the congregation that are in charge in any way. Uh, I mean, I've heard story after story of people getting kicked out of church for uh, presenting a truth that is biblical, but they don't agree. So they get ostracized or kicked out. So um, I'm glad that doesn't happen here. Uh, um, I, it, it's, it's such a, a relief and um, uh, such a wonderful thing. Uh, so I hope everyone has a good weekend and say uh, good night to everyone in the chat. I appreciate you guys and I look forward to next Friday. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brother Cripps. Uh, Brother Ben, give us your closing remarks. Uh, yeah, that was another great fellowship Friday. I do want to ask for again for forgiveness, uh, well, not again, but finally for uh, overstepping a little bit. At the beginning, it was a hectic week and I had a lot in my mind and I tend to get uh, excited and passionate about things and uh just i just uh overstepped more than i what i should have done so um i uh i had a good time though and enjoyed it learned some things and um looking forward to the next one all right thank you brother uh and i think we all agree that um uh, i mean if, maybe some people think uh, i've had people in the uh, chat room contact me and tell me that I'm a little too hard on people sometimes, and I'm too harsh, and they're uh, I'm offensive, and, uh, and maybe I am. I, I sometimes, but I have to say say what I think and try to do it as 
politely as I can. But I, uh, in spite of when I have to um, say something um, that could be critical of someone, um, I think in your case, Ben, uh, we all agree that you are overly self-critical. And, and we, uh, we think you have so much uh, uh, that you give and contribute that we value. And uh, uh, we, we all don't want you to be so hard on yourself. Okay. Um, let's go uh, see what Sister Paula has for her summary remarks. Um, great Friday as usual. Uh, I am always learning stuff from you guys, and you know this verse pops into my head, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And I, I feel like that's what we're doing here. In these casual conversations and, and you know, true-falsing each statement and then discussing it, um, it's wonderful. Also in the people in the chat, also sharing their opinions about it. Um, the more perspectives you get from different people, I think the wiser you get in any sort of um, topic mm -hmm. or, or discussion, uh, I think we can be very uh, narrow minded because that's just our nature. We see things as we are, but hearing what everybody else has to say is, is just really a blessing in it. I think it's going to help us in our walk um, just be sharper when we go out into the world, into the lost world, to be able to answer, you know, have an answer for every man. So I'm very grateful for it. And um, I do just want to say one, one other thing. I feel like I need to defend Florida just a little bit. <laughs> since, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> since, since Angel gave her scathing review. And that is not to say she was not right, because she's absolutely true. I went to Key West 25 years ago, stayed there for two weeks, and it's a cesspool. I mean, it's horrible. And I grew up in South Florida. It's extraordinarily liberal. I, I knew no Christian other than my granny um, the whole time I yeah, lived yeah. in South Florida. But I live up in the panhandle, and it's actually – more yes, that's we, we we call it lower alabama because yeah, yeah. it's very conservative up here we're part of the bible belt and it's kind of great because you get sort of the qualities of conservatism from alabama but then you have the beautiful beaches and i didn't even know it was like that up here but i didn't realize how different it is northern florida from southern and even yep, mid florida yep. that's, that's where, where i live is middle florida too yeah uh, that's, that's south florida, florida. florida. That's why we're a swing state, because the views are so different from north to the south. And in fact, I, I saw a meme once that said um, Florida is the only state where the more north you go, the more southern it gets. It's very mm. true because mm. the That's lower part cool. of Florida are like transplants. It's like a melting pot. Everybody and his cousin lives down there from all over. And here it's more like southern. You know, so I just wanted to yes. defend it just a little bit. It isn't horrible everywhere, but I do agree with her. I wouldn't ever want to go back to South Florida. It's just, especially right now, it's real bad. Um, but yeah. Howard County. County. Yeah, yeah. Real bad what's going on down there with all this craziness that's going on. But um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that in real quick. If you want to visit Florida, definitely stay up in the panhandle. We've got some of the most beautiful beaches and you don't have to deal with all the kind of liberalism and whatnot. But anyway, as usual, great fellowship with all you guys. I love you guys. I praise God for you. I praise God for our fellowship and uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. All right. Thank you, sister. Um, you probably don't know this, but uh, I lived in Florida in, in for a year and a half in 74 and 75. Remember back in that proud last century? I was a toddler. <laughs> yeah. Where at? Where did you live? I lived in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, but I, I traveled from Fort Pierce to Key West routinely. Uh, but I remember all, all the friends that I made when I lived there, they were from New York. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we used Bingo. to say, we used to say in Florida you have to go north to get south. Yeah, that's funny. I had yeah. never heard that before I saw the meme, but it it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, sister uh, 
Let me see, uh, Sister Angel, uh, will you give us your summary? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean to. I actually, you know, if it were uh, if it were possible somehow, there's a great big part of me that uh, despite all of the mess, I would still move back to my home because I miss it, even though logically it's much I'm much better off, much safer in almost every imaginable way here. Um, there's something about there's a lot of redeeming qualities about even South Florida, even Key West. I mean. I didn't realize people were liberal down there at the time. I mean, you know, I didn't know that I was, I was a dumb kid. Uh, uh, but um, I will say the Cubans, the Cubans are conservative and they will take issue with us saying that South Florida is entirely liberal because they're very conservative. And um, it's mostly the transplants that are, uh, are so liberal and ruining everything for everybody everywhere, um, <laughs> including Texas, where my other half of my family lives. Uh, now they've all transplanted to Texas and they've ruined that too. So, um, but uh, the panhandle is very nice. In fact, I know because when I was a liberal, that was the last place I wanted to go in Florida. So um, I didn't mean to take a shot at, at all of Florida. And like I said, I, I still love, I miss Florida. I'm planning to visit Florida this, this summer or this fall uh, for the first time in years. And uh, it's still worth it uh, to, 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 to visit, even if uh, even if you don't uh, don't stay for very long or, or stay away from 801 Duval Street if you do visit the U.S. But, um, <laughs> um, and I also want to say, Ben, uh, I thought what you said was really interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm going to look in. Uh, I, I didn't really want to, uh, I, because I haven't been able to look into it, I didn't really want to go into to too much of a discussion on it. But I, I actually, you know, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was actually a really interesting point, and I, I had, it got my wheels going. So don't feel, don't feel too bad about bringing that up. It was very thought provoking, um, and you know, just uh, guys, uh, uh, I, I hope that we can uh, uh, all. Uh, be back here next week if the world doesn't fall apart. I mean, literally, it's it's getting crazy. There was an earthquake in Florida again, and uh, here we had a a crazy storm that tore through. We had no warning. It's called a dura. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a duratio or something. It's a duratio. It's a some terrible like prolonged tornado forced wind storm <laughs> that tears across the Midwest that I had no idea they existed where uh, they it sends like shrapnel like missiles across you know across wherever it's it's you know it's it's uh, it's path um, you know it's really really powerful winds I guess up to 200 miles an hour so the weather's been crazy and uh, I, I feel like now I really don't know what's gonna happen um, uh, you know, day to day, let alone week to week in this crazy uh, year we're living in current year. But um, I, I do know that every time we join back together, it's, it's, it's a wonderful time. And I love you guys. And I love the, I love the chat, the congregation. You guys are, are the best and um, you know, just keep sending those questions and I can't wait to see you guys next week. All right. Thank you, sister Angel. And I saved uh, sister Lisa for last. So you can give us a summary and also a, promo for your program tomorrow night. Okay. Uh, let's see. Late night with Lisa and friends. Starts a little around a little bit after 8 p.m. And we're usually a little bit late, just hammering things out, making sure everything's good to go. So 8 o'clock tomorrow night, um, my channel, For the Most High Jesus. And we're going to be talking about, oh, just to give you a little teaser for tomorrow night, we're going to be talking... Brother Cripps is supposed to bring us everything you could ever want to know about heaven. And we're going to hold him to it because that was his promise. And then uh, Brother Ben's going to be talking about Q and some interesting things about a lawsuit in uh, California that some people are arguing actually sparked this whole shutdown thing. And uh, I'll, I'm also going to be talking about the transgender agenda. So that's tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. As far as this broadcast is concerned, I, I don't know, Brother Luke, how long have we known each other now? We've uh, been corresponding on and off for over 12, 13 years now, roughly. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I didn't realize. Uh, back when, yeah, when I first started, got involved with YouTube, but uh, and you were the first person ever on one of my group discussions when they when first started this. So, uh, yeah, a long time, sister. Yes, so uh, this is something uh, that, as uh, Brother Matthias has coined, has become a blueprint. 
we've been able to manage it. And I think that's because we approach it in the perspective that we're supposed to, which is that we're family. And while you can disagree with family, we're always supposed to be respectful and loving and kind and considerate. And I think we managed to do that. And I'm very proud to be a part of this uh, panel and this association um, as, as believers and with everyone out here in the chat as family. We don't always agree. But I do believe we have uh, remained consistent in showing uh, each other courtesy and kindness and respect and even appreciation for the opposing uh, opinion uh, or things that we might need to consider a little bit uh, more deeply or further. So uh, for that, I'm always looking forward to the fellowship. And I have, I think, made some wonderful friendships as a result, even though I've never seen you guys face to face. I do consider you to be family and friends, and I, I am uh, humbled by um, the experience that I've had here on YouTube, here on the panel, and also in, in getting to know you guys, uh, each each of you individually. God bless you all. All right. Thank you for the blessing. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, I'm happy to hear that uh, the subject of heaven is going to be discussed uh, tomorrow. Um, I did a, I have a playlist titled 50 hours in heaven and it's, it's not because I died and went to heaven for 50 hours and I came back to tell you <laughs> it's because it's 26 videos long and each video is about two hours. So there's about 50 hours of discussing heaven. There's a lot to, to, to learn about heaven and it's really the most wonderful subject and it's the most neglected subject in Christianity. So I'm happy to hear that you guys are going to be discussing it tomorrow night. So don't miss that. And uh, thank you, everybody on the panel. And thank you, everybody in the chat room. I uh, look forward to next time with you. And don't forget to join us also Sunday for our church service, 5 p.m. Eastern on this same channel, Church of the Eternally Secure. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus. <laughs>